This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. What is a millennial? Is it, I, I always get a bit confused. Is it someone born? What is it? Someone help me out. We're not live. We haven't started yet, have we? So it's not. It's just, what does this red light mean here? Yeah. Is that what? what is it? So you were born between 1981 and 1996. You're a millennial. Did you know that? Are you a millennial? You're not a millennial. No way. You're probably a millennial. You know, Jones, no, mate. No. <laughs> no you're a geriatric. It's four minutes after ten. Um, millennials, I think, have more problems with rent and property than any generation in living memory. And I've got two questions for you. One you won't answer because we're going to disprove it, really, in the course of the next 55 minutes or so, which is, why don't we talk about it more? Because every millennial has parents and grandparents, well, all but but a very tragic few. Millennials all have parents and grandparents, and you'd think, wouldn't you, that the situation of people, and at least we're not confining it to 1981 to 1996, that's just a useful category. Talking about the younger generation, but I think that probably goes up to about 40 now, doesn't it? People who thought that they would be property owners and, and yet are stuck in a never-ending cycle of renting. And and it's it's not just a cycle of renting. It's like that room in Star Wars where all the garbage was. Do you remember? When the walls start closing in, it's, it's, it's like it's getting worse. A 10% increase. I was trying to think. I know lots of people have been hit very hard with their mortgages. But if you had to find 10% more for your largest monthly outgoing every month... I do wonder how many people would actually uh, start. The, the, the wheels would start wobbling. Your, your financial security would start teetering. Here you go. Before I've even introduced the subject, John's been in touch to say, it's destroying us, James. We were renting a studio for, for £850 a month. Social services ordered me to give up work to help the children settle and to give me time to attend to all their doctors, dietitians, and CAMS appointments. You've obviously got some... Uh, children with 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 issues we had to move into a three-bedroom property which is now 1750 a month Uh, so we've halved our income and doubled our rent and it's about to go up again the uh, inevitability of it is what confuses me the 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 sense of it just oh yeah fine that's happening How, how much of a how much of a of an issue is it in in your life Cost of rent on new tenancies has gone up by 10.2% year on year, which has rendered November the most expensive month for renters in years. And when it says in years, I wonder whether it actually means ever. London, the worst affected. Rents rising faster in London than anywhere else in the country. And a newly let property in the capital, in in inner capital, has risen by 13.2%. So the average... Is three thousand one hundred and seventy-four pounds after tax, after tax that you would have to find every month. And I know averages are not, you know, uh, they can be unhelpful in some circumstances. But it is—it's absolutely extraordinary. I'm—I'm I'm more interested today in the what's of it than the whys. I'm more interested in what it has done to you, what it does to you, as opposed to why rents are so high. Because. Um, interest rates and uh, a lack of building and also every time I hear politicians talking about a lack of building I'm struck by how many properties are just empty I appreciate that's probably more of an urban issue possibly even more of a London issue than it is elsewhere in the country but if I was a politician (laughs) you must always catch me when I say that phrase by the way if I was a politician we'd all be doomed if I was a politician I would be as interested in empty unoccupied houses as i am as i would be in unbuilt houses i would very very much be looking at unoccupied houses but i wonder whether we have such an odd relationship with property in this country that the idea of somehow forbidding people to have unoccupied properties to have empty properties would 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 impinge upon some of our libertarian instincts i don't know Another one already before I've barely drawn breath. My, but James, me and my partner have just had to move out of London. Average wages. Um, the rent was taking up about 50% of both of our incomes. Landlords did nothing to um, uh, pass on reductions in interest rates. They constantly pass on the rises to their 
tenants, often because they're over-leveraged themselves on a property that they could only afford when interest rates were very low. So we need a little bit of why, I suppose, a little bit of what's going on. But but I'm more interested in what is happening to you. And uh, listen, I, I never know quite how to play this. So I have to obviously, not concede, that's not quite the right word, acknowledge is the word I'm looking for. I have to acknowledge that I am very luckily insulated from this reality. This is not something that I have personal experience of yet. And I'm not one of those idiots who thinks that personal experiences I had 30 years ago are in any way relevant to the same issues today. I, I, idiots perhaps a little strong, but there are few calls more frustrating especially in the context of property prices, there are few calls more more frustrating than the older generation, the boomers, uh, simply bemoaning the younger generation's inability to buy property by uh, revealing that when they were young, they bought a property for X thousand pounds and they don't have any concept of multiples. So we bought our first property for £6,000 and we work very hard and young people today should just cancel their Netflix subscriptions and eat less avocados. And you go, OK, £6,000, you say. And what was your what was your annual income? I said, well, £2,000, James. I said, so you bought a house for three times your annual income. Yes, James. And we work bloody hard. And I say, well, these days you would have to be able to find ten times your annual income, or 20 times your annual income. So could you, in 1954, on your income of £2,000 a year, bought a house for £30,000? No, I couldn't have done. Well, then just stop banging on about avocados and Netflix and young people of today don't know what a proper shift is. How, and if you'll indulge me slightly, because it's Friday and I always find my brain um, firing on slightly different cylinders from the rest of the week on a Friday... It's what I call the crackerjack, the crackerjack factor. What, 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 what does it mean in the bigger picture? Where does it, where does it lead? What, when I say what changes has it made to your life, I don't just mean how big a chunk is it taking out of your incomes and outgoings. I, I mean, does it actually, I don't want this to be true, but I think it must be. I try to imagine where Mrs. O'Brien and I would be if we were in that situation. I've told you a few times, and younger listeners find this almost impossible to believe, that we got, uh, just 23 years ago, 24 years ago next year, we got a mortgage for 110% of the value of our first property. 110%. So I don't know that I need to explain this in mathematical terms, but it meant that the bank gave us money which, with which we could buy a flat and have about 15 grand left over, or perhaps 15, 16 grand left over. So we went to Thailand. And that was so insane compared to what your experience is today. Please don't hate me. It, was, it wasn't my fault. I had no idea how lucky I was. But I use that as an example of how absurd it is for anybody, really, to uh, try to address the modern property system by drawing upon experiences from decades ago. So you go back further than me, and the multiples were ridiculously small. You go back to when we were getting onto the property ladder 20 years or so ago, and the money you could borrow was ridiculously cheap. I think it contributed in large part to the 2008 financial crisis, but we were all right by then. And of course, such is the nature of the mad market, that the equity goes up every year. The the value of the property goes up every year. So you're having theoretical cash. It's theoretical until you sell up or remortgage. You're having theoretical cash poured into your metaphorical pocket all the time. And where would you draw the... uh, Where would you draw the timeline? I suppose it's when mortgages just became expensive. And when the... No, I'll tell you exactly where the timeline is. And it's it's post-financial crash, isn't it? It's when the deposit became absolutely de rigueur. It's when a significant deposit in order to secure a loan for a home became de rigueur that everything changed. And that is probably the largest contributor to the renting explosion. The mayor's office... um, 
uh, according to Mark in Tooting, who's usually very reliable on such matters, says, according to the mayor's office, there are 30,000 long-term empty properties with the highest concentration being in Kensington and Chelsea. 30,000. Do you remember after, was it after the Grenfell, after the Grenfell Tower tragedy, it was suggested that some families may, may be housed almost um, compulsorily in properties that had stood empty for years. And that takes us back to the exponential increases, doesn't it? You know, I don't know, you're a Middle Eastern potentate or, or, a, or a Greek shipping tycoon. Why not buy a massive mansion in Kensington and just leave it? Watch it go up in value. It's probably over the last 20 years been a better investment than gold bullion or a Picasso painting. So why, why would you worry about sticking someone in it? It's, a, it's an asset. It's not a home. But I digress. 14 minutes after 10 is the time. I, I, I digress. Rents are ridiculous. I say that with a, 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 a smidgen of uh, uh, silliness. I, I'm conscious of not being affected by it yet, but I've got teenage children. They're, they're going to be moving into the rental market before you know it, aren't they? That's going to be happening sooner rather than later. So the, the, the two questions I've got as a consequence of that are, wh I mean, what does it do to your life? When rent is so ridiculous, 03456060973. And I mean that in the short term, but crucially in the long term as well. Because you'd be putting off having a family, I think. That was a bit I didn't want to say out loud. You'd be putting off having a family. You'd be changing life-held plans. You, 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 you'd be looking at your future and feeling differently about it from how you felt when you left school or college or when you set off on adult life. You've, I think you've been robbed of something by the ridiculousness of rent. And I don't know that it's anybody's fault. I don't know that we can identify the thief, but I think you've been robbed of something. So when I say how is it affecting your life, I don't just mean the Mr. McCorber question of what's coming in every month versus what's going out. I mean the, the actual life effects the life effects of ridiculous rents, the knowledge, and this must be the hardest thing. See, I speak as someone who was raised very much in expectation of being a property owner. And yet my financial situation when I got married, if it were to be reflected now, if we were to try to do in 2023 what we managed to do in the year 2000, I, I wouldn't have a prayer, even as a very well-paid for my age newspaper journalist. Um, horribly over-promoted, some might say, but I was on a proper, proper whack. But it was a fraction of what you would have needed to um, to get a to get a property. I, well, I, I never would have been able to get a deposit together. That the multiple of what I was earning to the flat was probably okay, actually. But I never would. Have, I never had any money left at the end of the year. So I, even privileged or well-off, middle class. The, the realisation that you may never be a property owner until you inherit money from people who you really don't want to die, I think is one of the biggest intergenerational changes that our society has undergone in the last 30 years, and yet we hardly ever talk about it. We do, a bit, but I mean, as a society, we, we hardly ever talk about it. So the life changes, the, the, the way it changes your life, or rather the impact it has upon your life, because it's not a change, it's a change in expectation, not a change in existence. And, and I suppose we, we should and we must offer up a little side order. Or No, actually, I won't do that. I, I'm, what about the older generation looking at the younger generation. I want to hear from you as well. I mean, why are we so bad at recognising how different it is? So how much of a shock was it to you when your children left home and the relationship with renting turned out to be utterly unrecognisable from the relationship that you'd had with it 30, 40 years previously, 25 years previously, rather? Uh, 17 after 10. There's quite a lot there to chew on, quite a lot there to get stuck into. If there's something I've missed that you want to draw attention to, then uh, feel free to do so. But that, that figure there, 30,000 empty properties in one city alone, you do sort of find yourself wondering whether unoccupied properties should be a, a political hot potato or at least an almost as hot political potato as the question of unbuilt properties. The time now is 10.18. The number you need is 0345 6060 James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. Big court case at the High Court, which is due to deliver a verdict in the next 10 minutes, um, or, or, or in about 10 minutes' time. We'll definitely be uh, jumping on that when it happens. The Duke of, Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, um, suing the Mirror Group for phone hacking offences, which, I, I mean, it's going to really, whatever the result is, is going to be big news. 21 minutes after 10 is the time. We're talking in the meantime about the UK's rental bill, which has more than doubled since 2010. OK, hands up if your income has more than doubled since 2010. Ooh, actually, this is awkward. Um, OK, everyone except me, hands up if your income has doubled since 20. Because nobody's income has doubled since 2010, has it? And yet your rent has. Your mortgage hasn't, I don't think. So what does it do to your life? Patrick's in Reading. Patrick, what would you like to say? Hey, James, how are you? Very well, mate. But I, I don't like this topic in the sense that I wish it wasn't happening but it is um and i find it very interesting i think it for me it's really interesting because it kind of kind of brings together like three or four different subjects mm. which i feel like you've touched upon over the last sort of six to nine months like well actually 12 months if we go back to kind of to trusses kind of yes. idea of what to do and then obviously went really well and then i think labor party kind of talking about mortgage tax but I remember you mentioning it and your callers mentioning it at the time going well, what about rent mm. and appreciate you can't mention it every day but <laughs> I mean it was always kind of the back of my mind going well I mean I live in a rented property my landlord has a mortgage if his mortgage goes up what's going to happen to me um, yeah and there's some good landlords I, I imagine most of them are good but have so, to get the money from somewhere. Yeah. So, so yeah. T- talk me so, through the details of where you are and and the role that yeah. rent plays in that in that location. So um, I live with my fiance now. Um, we moved into this house about eighteen months ago. So we're coming up for our the end of our initial kind of tenancy, which is two years. Um, in the agreement, there was no rise within the two years, but we're pretty confident that once the end of the two years, when we come to a new, it's going to go up. Yeah. and I think it's going to go up quite a lot. Um, our, my amounts, shall I tell you amounts? For that yeah, help? if you don't mind, it's up to you. It's not a very it's English fine. thing yeah. to do, is it? But, yeah. uh, but it, it, I'm Irish, so it's okay. I is, can yeah, be very is, is it different there? Is it different? If someone yeah. goes, comes up to someone and says, how much are you earning? What sort of scratch are you on now, Pat? They'll tell you, just tell <laughs> yeah, exactly. them. All right, go on then. <laughs> All right, um, so we're, our rent is 2600 a month. Um, we're... I'm kind of thinking it's going to go up by at least ten percent, probably a bit more. Yeah. Um, like we both so you're, really you're nudging cool. towards three grand then. So still below yeah. the average for London, but you're in red. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing. So like, um, and then both earn good salaries, and then we've just noticed over the last sort of six months, you know, we've earned good salaries even on our own, but combined, we're kind of seeing it. Cost of living's really starting to hit us now. And I sound like really, I am really privileged to what we earn. No, but I don't know. I don't. I I know why you do that. But we'll, 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 you know, there are different degrees of luck right across the population. But, but also the phone line's a bit weird. So I'm going to hurry you up a tiny bit. How? how, I mean, how? How did you expect to be earning jointly what you're earning, and then looking at your outgoings and thinking, blimey. Not at all. And I think that there's two things as well. So I think the generational thing is a really interesting conversation. Yeah. I remember dad was just like, well, just buy a house. And yeah. I said, well, I can't afford it. And then we're taking him to a new development. And I specifically said to the agent, I said, I can tell him the price until the end. Yeah. And went around and he was like, oh, this is lovely. Yeah, just this house is lovely. Get this. Go on. And then he told him how much it was. And he was like, oh, my God. He couldn't. He actually couldn't speak for the rest of the day. He was so shocked. And it was like three quarters of a million, like a million. I and mean, that was 10 years ago. And now, and that's complete. Are you ever going to be a property owner? Um, I think eventually. I would. I mean, again, it's the hope that kills you. Like I'm thirty. I was thirty-eight a couple of weeks ago, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm nearly forty, and I, I'm not actually any closer to owning a house than I was when I was twenty. And and, and you're waving goodbye to, to thirty grand of taxed income every single year with nothing to show for it except the home that you live in. I know that's a bleak analysis, and it sounds. Well, I know it doesn't sound smug, but it 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 it, it, it it sounds. I'm doing what I told Patrick not to do, isn't it? And apologising for being luckier, Patrick. Thank you. Darren's on the on the Scottish borders. It says here, which doesn't really narrow things down. You're nowhere near that where that tree was, are you, Darren? 
No, no, I'm not. What would you like to say, mate? Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a renter currently, but I used to be. Um, about um, well, from from the sort of age of twenty one right up to the age of thirty, I was in the rent market. Um, yeah. And um, I was staying in Edinburgh at the time, which was quite high. Took up most of most of my wage, so there was nothing left to set aside for a deposit. For a house or anything like that, and then I met my ex partner, and we started a family, and we were still renting, but we got into social housing. Um, but the family grew, so we had to go back into the private market. Um, and the situation. How, how long ago of, is this, mate? This is about fifteen years ago now. Okay. Um, but the the, the 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 rent was still going up. And what that did was it meant that we had to rely on things like payday loans. Crikey. And if that was 15 years ago, then God knows what, what the situation would be like now with rents having doubled in the last 13 years. And, and you know, the situation today is going to be at least, uh, uh, well, at least twice as bad as it was 13 year, 15 years ago. Joe, thank you, Darren. Take care. Joe's in Harlow. Joe, what, what sort of impact has it had on your life? Yeah, uh, hi James. So oh. yeah, I was um, last year. I've been renting since about eighteen. I'm now twenty seven. Right. Um, la- last year, I had to move out my last place, emergency quick, because I had a nightmare tenant nearby me, and yeah. I just had to leave for mental health reasons. Fair enough. Um, and I had to move into my um, partner's parents' place. Oh, blimey! <laughs> I've been here for about a year now. I work full time. I can't afford to move out. Is your partner um, there as well? Yeah, yeah, my partner yeah. lives here with us. Um, I'm in a shed at the back bottom of the garden. Really? <laughs> where... is, it a, is it a shed or is it is it a nice sort of garden office type it's, building? It's nicer than a shed, but yeah. it's made of wood. <laughs> I had one of those, and I, I did the show from there during lockdown. It, I mean, it, it, it's not the same, is it? it? Have you got running water? Yeah, uh, not in here. I have to go into the house to yeah. get my tea. No, I know you've got like running that. water in the house, Joe. I, I, yeah, I'm not that familiar with Harlow, but I'm confident <laughs> that you're on the you're on the water mains. But I mean, you haven't got yeah. a toilet and stuff like that. You've got to come. So in the middle of the night, if you need a, well, I don't want to know what you do in those circumstances. But it's it's sub it's suboptimal. It was supposed to be temporary, but if they've yeah. doubled, if rents have, I mean, gone through the roof since you moved out of your last place, getting back onto the ladder is going to be doubly difficult. Yeah, I mean, um, just to get looked at, you need to earn two and a half times the monthly rent just to get through the first stage to look for places. And, and you have to and, prove that. You have to give them your pay slips, do you? Or well, it, yeah, I mean, even though even though I uh, you know I work full time, I don't earn bad money. Sure. My money's okay. They just don't look at me. I can't afford. I mean, I need all I can afford without a guarantor is eight hundred pound a month place. But where, where can you find a place for eight hundred pounds a month that? I don't know. How does, it, how does it end then? Are you, I mean, I don't want to make light of your situation, but are you going to be in that shed for, 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 for years? I mean, um, maybe. I mean, my partner's out of work at the moment due to uh, mental health reasons. Right. So, um, you know, it's ba- basically it's until they're ready to get back into work. And then um, you'll, have, you'll have a bit more spending power and you'll be able to have a look at uh, uh, you know all the years i've been doing this I've, I've had this little thought in the back of my mind whenever we talk about property that that the other end of it is unsustainable that they can't keep going up some some years but property if you've got a, if you've got a mortgage on a place let alone if you own it outright you're going to be making more money from increases in property prices than you are from your actual income and you always think this can't go on this can't go on and yet here we are 20 years i've been doing this nearly and and the situation is unchanged albeit that the increases now annually are nothing like what they were um 20 years ago joe i wish you the best you know i do half past 10 is the time that uh ruling on prince harry could drop while we take the news headlines from thomas watts james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc (laughs) you know when i i I don't know whether or not it endears me to people in the same line of work but when i confess to you that i've got nothing to say and therefore we're just waffling to fill a little bit of space before keir starmer gets to his feet at pmqs or 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 before um something happens at the state opening of parliament or the king's speech or whatever it may be uh one of the correspondents i'm not going to embarrass anybody by providing further details than that currently waiting for the ruling on prince harry's hacking claims one of the correspondents has just said and we're standing outside a modern part of the courthouse he's (laughs) 
<laughs> that's such a lovely example of having having to keep talking, having a, a, the, 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 the studio have crossed live to you outside the High Court. And you've got absolutely nothing to say, except we are still waiting for the ruling to be handed down on the hacking claims Prince Harry and three others have brought against Mirror Group newspapers. The Duke of Sussex and three others allege phone hacking and the judge will rule shortly on 33 sample news stories. Um, Harry himself seeking £320,000 in damages. But the money is, the money is an interesting uh, element of this. I wonder how many people listening to this understand how absolutely bonkers this system is. So there was a settlement last week involving News Corp newspapers, the, the owners of the now defunct News of the World and the Sun newspaper. And they settled in a, a, a very expensive terms with a number of public figures, including a pal of mine, actually. And the settlement involves them insisting that there was no wrongdoing. So they give you hundreds of thousands of pounds and publish a, a, a statement saying, we, we do not accept that we did anything wrong. But by doing that, they kind of stop you from pursuing the case any further. Because if the case goes further and the judge settles less money on you than the offer that they made with no admission of wrongdoing, then you are liable for legal fees. You're certainly liable for your own legal fees. I think you may even be liable for theirs. So imagine that I accuse you of hacking my phone and you say, I did not, I did not hack your phone. But hey, look, we've, we're both very busy people. Here's £200,000 to go away. And I say, no, I'm not, I'm not going away. I'm, I want to pursue this all the way to court. And we go to court and you're found guilty. And the judge says, this is an outrageous this is an egregious crime. I'm going to fine you £150,000 in damages. And then I get hit with a £1 million legal bill. So I don't know. I mean, hands up now, seriously, if you understood that. And don't say I did, James, because I've heard you explain it before. How many people actually understand that? Because where are you going to read it? You're not going to read it in the newspapers, <laughs> are you, that, that are in exactly this situation. So um, poor fella still standing outside a modern part of the court uh, telling us that the newspaper would vigorously defend itself against allegations of wrongdoing. Um, uh, and yes, that, that verdict, poor fella. Honestly, it's the worst gig. 10.36 is the time. Let's get back to renting. James is in Crawley. James, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, yeah. So Hello, mate. Just hearing, obviously, the discussions being had, it made me ring solely because of my own situation. So at present, I'm living in my car. Oh. Uh, it, it is what it is. There's various different circumstances that have accused me really, to come to this point. Yes. Um, Recently trying to rent. Uh, bear in mind, I, I'm not on a bad salary. I'm not on a, a good, I'm sort of really average, if you like. Yeah. Uh, I've got two children. Unfortunately, I broke up with uh, the mother, so I'm no longer living there. And that's, uh, that's, that's that the, the, the main change in your circumstances. Because so, you're going from naught to 60, aren't you? You're having to go from not paying anything at all. Well, paying for the one property that you all share together. You've got to start from scratch on a new property for yourself. Absolutely. The, the reason for our breakup is solely down to my own mental health. I've got various issues with my mental health, currently going through, obviously, all the the health and sport to I'm get sorry. that on track. Yes. So it leaves me in a bit of a, a peculiar position. So I left probably on the 17th, 18th of October. Right. I had nowhere, not a car, nothing. So I was living in my work van. So I'd finish, obviously, my day at work uh, as a company-owned van. Yes. They'd let me take it home. Uh, obviously, they're un unaware. Right. And then up parking up on the lay bike a bit of a distance away so no one saw. I'll sleep in the van next morning, shower at local services, and off you go. So I've approached the, obviously, the councils trying to get assistance. Because I'm a single 28-year-old man who yeah. works, yeah. they're not interested. It is what it is. No, of course. Um, well, I mean, they can't be, can they? Because they've got people in even more dire straits than you to look after first. Absolutely, 100%. I fully get that, you know. I don't it's not fair. It's, it's not, it's not right. It just, as you said a moment ago, it is what it is. Absolutely. So even with the private renting market at the minute, so especially uh, like the Crawley area, which is for some reason crazy pricing at the minute. It's I think it is everywhere, but that's a feeder town, yeah. isn't it? I suppose. It, it, so. Absolutely, because it's on Gatwick Air, but it's also half an hour train ride into central London. Yeah. <clears throat> you get a lot of people moving in all of a sudden, so it's, it's gone horrendous. So if you're looking at like a one-bedroom uh, flat or even a, a, a studio flat, you're looking anywhere from £1,200, £1,300 plus a month. Um yeah. 
that on top of obviously the, the, the maintenance I pay, I think it's like 400 odd quid a month I pay maintenance. Right. You know, if I take home 1600 quid a month, I'm left with nothing. <laughs> so it's borderline impossible really to get nowhere. Well, well, I mean, gotta, it can't be very good for your health, mental or physical, to be living in your car. I couldn't agree more. I've got friends and whatnot, hence why I've had to give a, a, a bit of a false name. No, so, because I don't want anyone really knowing the extent of the circumstances, but they'll, they'll let me go, uh, stay around every now and then kind of thing. Right. Um, is, there no kind of one, you, is there no one you can tell the full extent of the situation that you're in? So I've got a mental health team. I've got a crisis team. that I, 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 I'm currently being um, diagnosed with something called psychosis and bipolar. Right. So it's a... Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a mixture of things, but it's yes. just unfortunately the modern day of of living. It's kind of like it or lump it because where else can you go? What can you do? Yeah, yeah, it's just one of those. Trying to be depressing. I just had to get it off and. Uh, a lot of people don't see it, unfortunately. No, I, well, of course they don't, and a lot of people don't show it for the reasons that you've very perfectly explained, James. So, what I mean, I hesitate to ask this question, but what does? What what does the change look like? What does the I mean? What what are you aiming for? What does the light at the end of the tunnel look like? Uh, it, to, to be honest with you, and I don't mean this in a really weird way. Yeah. Every day that I wake up is a good day. Oh, mate, that's wonderful. So you take that every day at a time. Yes. I mean, it gets to the point where you have to shower at a local leisure centre. Yes. And at first, very degrading, and I've gone from having everything to nothing. But then when you pull up, you also see five or six other people doing the same thing. Do you really? And it gets to the point where the leisure centre will turn a blind eye that you're literally just popping in to use the shower. They don't mind because they understand sort of the circumstances. Yeah. So when you get speaking to them guys and you realise actually they've all got parts around the county that they all park up on. That's their safe space, if you like. Yeah. And you're all in the same position or the same boat where you are all going through the same things. <laughs> and you ask each other. Some, uh, there's one guy that's done it for about six years. Really? And, you, know, you speak to them and it's like, how do you survive? You know, I mean, there's been nights, James, where I've woken up, I've had frost on my hair, you know, and everyone's nice and, like, especially the council, very quick to go, well, you're earning a wage, go and, uh, go and get a, um, a hotel. Right. Well, that's a well and good, so you can do that, but at the price of the hotels at the minute, you're looking probably 100 quid plus a, a night. Yes. So I can do that for the first three or four nights, but then how do I eat for the rest of the month, or how do I get to them from work, or take my kids out of a weekend, you, you know, it, it's, yeah, you're in sort of dire straits, what do you do? It, so you know. you're just to clarify, you're in full time work. Yep. And you're waking up with frost in your hair, in your car, and your maintenance yeah, is. I, I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, even if you weren't paying that, you'd you'd not exactly be living it up, would you? But that that is the no, difference but, between being able mm. to keep a roof over your head and not really, isn't it? And, and and I know that you 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 wouldn't want to not pay that because you're a dad and and you, you know. They're your children. I would never see them go about. I'd go about. I've missed oh, no. meals and all sorts just to be able to take them to McDonald's when I've got them. You know, yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. And, um, and, 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 it, and I, I, just, I, 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 and forgive me for being nosy and tell me to that's right. sod off. If, if, but what, what about mum and dad or, or someone that you could just so get a my, le- my dad died about three years ago now. Oh, he was sorry. probably my best friend and my bigger supporter. Yeah. Uh, so whenever I was having a bit of a crisis or there was an issue, he was always there. Not yeah. uh, financially, they're both severely disabled, so I was effectively his carer for quite some time. Okay. Uh, he passed away. The relationship strained with, uh, obviously, my mum, so right. I haven't spoken to her for about two years. Oh, dear. Um, okay. It, it's just one of those things, unfortunately. When you suffer with mental health as well, a lot of people look down as a, it's an excuse. Um, take do. it from me, it takes the best part of seven tablets every single day. Yes. It is not an excuse. You know, I'll do anything not to have the issues that I do have. Or even, to be fair, to understand my own brain at times, yes. it's a real struggle. I, I, I do. So, I'm, I, you're in a safe space here, James. No one's going to be suspicious or accusing you of anything, but I appreciate society can be a very unfriendly place for, for invisible conditions, can't it? Even visible conditions, but... I suppose I have to re- point out to everybody else listening that Rishi Sunak has just declined to appoint a Minister for Disabilities, which perhaps gives an indication of, of w- w- where people like James and many others listening to this programme um, sit on the current Prime Minister's list of priorities. What, I, what are you going to do for Christmas? Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Um, there's a few lay buys on my up. Uh, <laughs> I don't know is, is, is the honest truth. I'm trying very hard not to sort of cross that bridge. Okay. And and communication with your partner, your ex, has broken down completely, has it? 
Uh, we, we can be civil uh, right. for, for the sake of the kids. I mean, it's very, like I say, it was very much uh, my my issues is the reason for the relationship. Your, your illness. No... Your, your illness. Uh, absolutely. It's yes. one of the things I hear for about five years okay. where I'd hear voices um, behind me talking to me. Yeah. And sometimes they'd be aggressive voices. Sometimes they'd be just a bit weird. Yeah. Um, I thought nothing of it. I used to put my headphones in. Uh, even now I do it. Yeah. More of an excuse now. I can walk down the street and I put headphones in. Sure. So if they get a bit intense, it almost appears that I'm on the phone to somebody. Yeah. So you don't get the weird looks that perhaps I used to be getting. Or, oh, you um, yeah, if you try and focus on sort of one conversation at a time and you've got a voice in the back of your head constantly going on, if you have the radio full whack whilst having a conversation with someone, it's almost nigh on impossible to hold a, one singular conversation. So I'm on various medication now, which, to be fair, have helped tenfold. Um, obviously, there's still... You still get that you're good in bad days. You're... You're naturally going to get those, um, but yeah, no. You, in relation to my ex, oh, it has broken down to a point. I mean, I still love her, vice versa. It's just one of those things we're probably better off at the moment not being together. But again, she doesn't know the full circumstances. No, I'm living at I, 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 all I can say to you is that I, 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 it's a privilege to talk to you. It really is, and 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 to hear the strength that you're bringing to the situation that you find yourself in. but I, I And I can't give you advice. I wouldn't patronise you or pretend that I'm qualified to do so. But but I really feel, mate, that you, you've got to find someone else to to, to lay it all out. So, so I want someone else to know what you're going through. Do you see what I mean? And I know you've got the mental health team with you and they, they do a brilliant job in incredibly difficult circumstances. But yeah. knowing you, just, just on the strength of this very short phone call, People who know you better than I do must also uh, recognise that you're you're clearly a really lovely man, and they will. You might be surprised, perhaps, by how people would respond to knowing a little bit more about how bad things are for you at the moment. I think it's more the societal thing. You yeah. always think everyone's going to look down on you and yeah. whatnot. And it's, it's a really hard thing to swallow, especially if you're in that situ- uh, situation. I'd love to uh, not, you know, exactly as you just did. I'd love to give someone advice and go, oh, look, if you're feeling a bit, yeah. bit down. Go and have a chat with someone. The problem is when you're in sort of like, I don't know, circumstance. Yeah. To open up to someone like yourself, you, with the greatest respect, you're a random. I'm never going to meet Mark Spurser. It's nice and easy <laughs> to have this conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you. It's a you it's not an how issue. dare you call me a random? I'm a best-selling <laughs> author and very popular radio presenter. What an appalling <laughs> thing. To, what an appalling thing. And I hope we do meet one day, actually. I, I hope I prove you wrong on that. And that... And that things that things are better for you when they do. But but just think on what I said. I, I, everything you've said makes perfect sense. It's easier to talk to me than it is to talk to someone that you've known for ten years. I, of course it is. I get that completely. But just just do me that tiny favour of just thinking about whether or not maybe there is somebody to whom you could share it with, whom you could share a little more detail. That's all. Absolutely. And, I will. And, and look after yourself. All right. You too. Take care, James. Cheers. God bless. 10.47 is the time. The ruling in that case involving Prince Harry has begun. The judge currently ruling on 33 sample news stories. Uh, I can tell you he has concluded that there was, quote, extensive, end quote, phone hacking by Mirror Group newspapers from 2006 to 2011. I quote again, even to some extent, end quote, during the Leveson inquiry into media standards. That is the early findings of Mr. Justice Fancourt at the High Court today. Uh, Much more on this after this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 10 minutes to 11 and the Duke of Sussex was the victim of unlawful information gathering according to a judgment in the process of being handed down at the High Court. It follows a trial in which Prince Harry and three others, the former Coronation Street actress Nikki Sanderson, the former wife of the comedian Paul Whitehouse, Fiona Whiteman and the actor Michael Turner, known professionally as Michael Lavelle um, have brought against Mirror Group newspapers, which publishes the the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror and the Sunday uh, People. They had largely contested the claims and claimed that none of the articles referred to in the case had resulted from hacking. But as I say, the uh, the Judge Justice Fancourt, Mr. Justice Fancourt, has ruled that there was extensive phone hacking by Mirror Group newspapers between 2006 and 2011, which is a period specified in the claim and 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 the, and the stories referred to. Um, it doesn't mean that that 
was the only period in which extensive phone hacking may have taken place. It's just the focus of this particular legal action. And I think particularly troubling for everybody, really, but, but for the people on the hook for this in particular, is the notion that even during the Leveson inquiry, uh, journalists from the Mirror Group were hacking the phones of people who were... Um, well, the Leveson inquiry was looking into ethics in, in the press. It was, I think, Theresa May who cancelled Leveson too, to the to the delight of um, uh, all of the media that, that um, had been caught up in phone hacking allegations. Uh, an, an extraordinary business. Uh, the former chief executive officer of Mirror Group newspapers, a woman called Sly Bailey, according to Mr. Joseph Fancourt, knew of the hacking and turned a blind eye. So... That's 15 of the 33 articles that Prince Harry cited as evidence of his phone having been extensively hacked. Um, he has has been found for. I, I wonder whether I wonder whether any of the newspapers will have the audacity to, to focus on the 18 cases that he's lost. I wouldn't even make that joke in normal circumstances. But in the country we live in, with the state of the newspaper industry that some of us are familiar with, the um, the possibility cannot be dismissed. But we shall be bringing you a little bit more on this story as and when it um, uh, as and when it occurs. But as things stand. Now, the uh, judge has ruled there was extensive phone hacking by Mirror Group newspapers, even to some extent during the Leveson inquiry into media standards. A lot of love coming in for James, if you're still listening. An awful lot of love and, and a lot of people who would like to help you as well. But it's such a difficult thing for us to police um, uh, uh, on that front that I'm not sure what we can do, but I will look into uh, what, what, what possibilities there may be. 10.53 is the time. It's rent, you see. Um, full-time job with the added complications of relationship breakdown and mental health issues, but despite those two burdens, the man is managing to hold down a full-time job. He simply can't afford to pay rent because rent is so high. And uh, I think we'll all remember that phrase, won't we, for, for, for a long time to come about waking up with frost in your hair. Sean's in Cambridge. Sean, what made you pick up the phone? Um, firstly, I just want to say a huge well done to the last caller. Yes. Um, it's so hard to articulate, um, you know, your own inner workings when you are suffering from chronic mental health issues. Yes. Um, I have also been in serious chronic mental health issues over the course of most of my adult life um, as a result of working in the hospitality industry and never really being able to make ends meet. Um, fortunately, thanks to uh, the progression of my partner's situation, I can now see the contrast between being in that chronic situation and how much of an effect that had on my mental health and my suicidal ideation and yes. and the situation that I was in. Um, what, what I kind of want to bring to the table in this conversation um, is something that I've wanted to call in about many, many times. And that is the, the larger issue, because I feel like these are symptoms of a much larger problem that we don't really talk about in the media or in politics. And that is the, the fact that these are symptoms of the current economic paradigm itself, that this isn't really a new thing. It's just a continuation of policies and sort of actions made by many governments in the world over the course of, of decades. And we don't seem to talk about that. Well, we, the, the we, way we, we, we do talk about it a bit. And, and of course, you know, the, the, the capitalistic model is, is critiqued quite frequently. And, and I understand your point and I understand your, your priorities, but, but I'm interested in making my listeners today aware of the reality of what rent is doing to people in the now in the moment, um, as opposed to, and I, and I say this very, very respectfully, as, as opposed to um, uh, e economic critiques of the whole world. I could appreciate your, your focus on that. So, so, uh, so what, what I mean, I, I, people like me need help understanding what life is like for people like you, if you see what I mean. <laughs> 
Well, what life was like for me was spending more than half of my wages on just making sure that I had somewhere to live in the first place before I even concerned myself with bills on top of that. Then not having anything left over, which forced me into crediting situations, which has exacerbated that problem. I think that's what you've expressed so well is the sense that that you start with the burden of mental health issues and, and... and and then the the reality of this relationship between income and outgoing makes absolutely everything worse. These are these these are so straws much, that can break so camels' worse. backs. Um, listen, I, I I think I was unfair to you there, and I've got a couple of minutes left before the news. So so do do Sean explore a little further the kind of uh, the point that you wanted to make about the broader economic realities. I've, I've, I've explained why we won't be doing it on a very, very regular basis. The only reason I wanted to bring it to yes. the table is because of the fact that when you talk about situations with schools, the NHS, mm. all of the different subjects that you cover, and I admire you for bringing those things out the way that you do, is that I feel like these things are connected in a, a very intrinsic way to the way that the larger economic situation is. And I just don't feel like that gets the coverage it deserves Fair enough. in terms of how do we move forwards from that and set an example as a country. Well, I, I to- think if I, I, if, if I were to mount a defence, uh, we, we talked about it yesterday. We, we took calls on school dinners yesterday or the day before and callers in Northern Europe, callers in Scandinavia, pointing out that having some of the highest taxes in the Western world are the reason why their children have a much better diet at school, why they have a much better education system. So I think I think we come at it usually on, on the specifics of the case uh, uh, rather than... I, 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 sorry to interrupt, but it's unfortunate I did actually miss yesterday's that's because okay. I was in the hospital all day. <laughs> that's, that's so, so typical. No, it is, but I, I, um, shall, I shall be mindful of what you've said, Sean. Like, whenever we address issues like this, I'll be even more mindful than I am already of drawing it into the macroeconomic model that, that we all live under because you are obviously right and, and that's why I've, I've corrected my attempt to steer you away from it you are right an awful lot of this stuff never gets fixed until we address the fundamental issue of people being persuaded to, to think that a system that is deliberately and violently skewed against them is a system that they should use their political power to defend it's another point we make regularly I think it was um and Naira Bevan, who made the point first that the whole project of the Conservative Party in the 20th century is to persuade Labour with a small L, i.e. you and me and everybody listening, to use its political power, i.e. its votes and its democratic rights, to protect wealth, i.e. the people who are never ever going to worry about rents because they are the ones receiving them. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 11 is the time. You'll forgive me for... Uh, I shall await the counsel of people a little closer to the story before drawing any broader conclusions about the significance of this finding at the High Court where it has been ruled in the last 10 minutes that Prince Harry was a victim of phone hacking. Mirror Group have now apologised unreservedly for historical wrongdoing. Um, In a statement, a spokesperson for the publisher said, we welcome today's judgment that gives the business the necessary clarity to move forward from events that took place many years ago, where historical wrongdoing took place. We apologize unreservedly, have taken full responsibility and paid appropriate compensation. Um, The point being, of course, that they knew they were guilty. (laughs) And it's gone all the way to the high court. And uh, you've only got really, people with pockets as deep as Prince Harry's in a position to pursue these cases um, as assiduously as he has managed to do. And there is more to come, which is why I will await the counsel probably of Evan Harris at Hacked Off, who, who is um, one of the best informed people on this front. The significance not only of this judgment, this ruling, um, for uh, for Mirror Group newspapers, Prince Harry and his co plaintiffs, but also, of course, for the cases still to come, because he is uh, uh, in conjunction with other public figures, including the mother of the murdered teenager, the victim of the racist murder, Stephen Lawrence's mother, Doreen, Baroness to you, Baroness Lawrence. Um, There are other cases with other news publishers that are yet to come before the court. Um, in fact, I, even I can't remember all of them, but I, I, I think I don't think there is a major 
newspaper publisher apart from the guardian that is that is not implicated in some of these allegations and accusations but as i say um evan will join us when he gets out of the courtroom and talk us through the impact of this finding it is five minutes after 11 um and I'm going to move on shortly, but I, I just just looking at what other people are saying, it is it is a huge victory for Prince Harry, absolutely huge victory for Prince Harry. And in fact, yesterday there were a couple of stories around attacking him, and I wondered why. I thought that's odd. Is it you know? I know there's a why in the month, and therefore they'll be attacking Prince Harry and his wife. But the 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 the, the sheer scale of the abuse that is heaped on the Duke and Duchess of Sussex by British newspapers is breathtaking. Um, and this is part of the reason why, because he has the guts and the capacity and the resources to refuse to be bullied by some of the most bilious and unpleasant human beings that have ever deigned to call themselves journalists. Um, so a little more on that later this hour. Six minutes after 11 is the time. Okay, this is a hardy perennial of the radio phone-in. And whenever I find myself approaching a hardy perennial of the radio phone-in, I have a little voice in my head that tells me to try to do it differently from the last time you did it, or try to do it differently, dare I say, from how everybody else does it. Sometimes I think that's a mistake. 350,000 parents in England alone, I don't have the figures at the moment for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, 350,000 parents in England were fined last year for taking their children out of school on unauthorised holidays. 356,181 penalty notices. So, in a way, if we were to... I know that a, a, a lot of single parent families and um, I, I, I'm being just a little bit mischievous in looking at this. But if you were to say incorrectly that every one of those fines was issued to a family where there's two parents, then you could double it. So it's 350,000 family units, not 350,000 parents, because then you'd split it, wouldn't you? You'd say, we both got it. Um, issued for taking children on unauthorised family holidays in the past academic year. It's the highest number on record, and it's gone up by 24% in 2019. Um, Ahmed has pointed out there's no why in December. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, what is the figure? Of, is it? I, I, yeah, all right, everyone's a critic. 24% um, since 2019. Now, I, I'm very conscious of high horses. It's an odd job, this. It's an odd job because in some ways, the higher your horse, the more effective you can be doing this for a living. Uh, not that long ago, I would be very much of the view that I will climb onto the highest horse in the land and, and throw down my judgments and condescensions to people who clearly care less about their children's education than I do, uh, than I care about mine. And I would do the same with Jamie. I'd, I'd accuse you of caring less about your children's health than Jamie Oliver does. Actually, I'd still do that. If you attack Jamie Oliver for his initiatives on, on school dinners and things like that, then he is demonstrating more concern for your children's health and lifestyle than you are, which should be a source of, of epic shame. But the country's gone to a strange place in recent years. We talked last week, I think, about how lockdown had broken the relationship between parents and teachers. Do you remember? I think it was the week before last. And it was teachers who were queuing up to tell us that the, the days of being able to rely upon a parent to support you in pursuit of educating their child are over. Uh, and not in all cases, but the, but the presumption that if a child is in bother and needs either steering onto a straighter course or needs to pull their socks up, academically speaking, the idea that a parent would be the ally of the teacher appears to have, um, well, if not dissipated completely, then declined, declined considerably. And I think this is part of that. I think the idea that you look at your child's education and think, ah, never mind, we can save a few quid on a fortnight in Barbados if we take them out of school during term time. I think that is a, I, I genuinely think, this is why I've already acknowledged the highness of my horse. I do think that's a really, really terrible thing. 
I understand it, and I'm not going to bang on about my own luck stroke privilege, but, you know, yes, we can pretty much afford to go on the holidays that we want to go on during the school holidays. And if we couldn't, and we looked at the numbers and thought, crikey, we could go to Thailand if we went during term time, but during during uh, during school holiday time, it's, it's going to be a fortnight in Margate. I, I get it. I do understand it. But I think that the the shift of priorities nationally speaking, is a tragedy. If you take children out of school during term time, you get a £60 fine. If you haven't paid it after 22 days, it goes up to 120 If it's still not paid, you can be prosecuted. You can go to court. Head teachers have the power to do it, but it looks to me, with 250,000 handed, 350,000 handed out last year alone, it looks to me as if people have just priced it in. People have just factored it in now to their annual holiday. And and I'm going to do an open-minded phone-in on why you think that's okay. So there's two contributions to this conversation that I want. I want the parents who think it's okay and the teachers who can explain why it isn't. So 11 minutes after 11 is the time. 350,000 families across the country, and these are only the ones that got caught or that had teachers bothered to find, have decided that having a holiday, having a, a, a certain type of holiday is more important than their children's education. That's how it looks to me. I could be wrong. Talk me through your thought processes and tell me why I should keep my beak out and stop making sweeping judgments about the level of concern that you have for your child's education. All right? 0345 6060 973. And then if you're a teacher, tell me how big a deal this is. You may tell me it's not as big a deal as, as some sort of sharp-elbowed middle-class do-gooders think that it is. You've got a child, two weeks out or a week out, they come back, they could have had chicken pots, they could have been ill. That doesn't really scupper a child's entire... So how big a deal is it? 0345 6060 973. I've got a problem with the parents that do this. And my problem, I think, is this. Children obviously need educating, but they also need to understand the balance of power in a classroom or the balance of power in a school. I was looking at some footage this morning of some uh, young boys on a tube train terrorizing a passenger. And, and you know that that kind of behavior is going to be um, replicated in school. So some of the tales that we hear now of pupils teaching teachers, treating teachers appallingly, are becoming endemic. They used to be exceptional. Whenever we do it on the program, I think back to 15 years ago when a friend of mine was a teacher and was threatened with sexual violence by a 14-year-old boy, and I, and I couldn't believe it. It made my hair stand on end. Now it's commonplace. And I, and I think that for a parent who would be mortified to discover that their son was engaging in that sort of behavior... I think a parent who thinks it's okay to take their kid out of school during term time is actually contributing to that contempt. And, and that's, that's why I'm interested in talking to you, because I don't think you realize that you're contributing to an atmosphere in which children in school will treat teachers appallingly, because the message that you're giving them, and I think you get a lot of it from the media, I think when teachers take industrial action and right-wing blowhards are queuing up to attack teachers, I think it's almost inevitable that parents and some children, if they're listening in the car on the way to school, will take away from that the idea that it's fine to treat teachers with contempt. The front page of the best-selling newspapers in the country treat teachers with contempt. If radio phone-in hosts treat teachers with contempt, talk about them having it easy, uh, then why on earth... Would some people not, by a process of, um, if you like, uh, propagandist uh, 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 osmosis, why would some parents and teachers not, um, some parents and children not respond by thinking that it's okay to give teachers a kicking? I'm not going to put Chris in Dagenham in Idiot's Corner because I can't tell from his text whether or not it is in good faith or aggressively phrased. But he, he says, did you intervene? And the answer to that, Chris, is no, I didn't intervene when I was watching footage on my phone of some children uh, uh, harassing a woman on public transport that she had filmed and then posted on Twitter. How, how do you think I might have intervened, mate, on that one? It's uh, No, so I'm presuming you didn't hear my description of what actually went on, and um, I, I don't think Idiot's Corner necessarily is a destination for people who've engaged engaged finger engaged texting finger before engaging brain or ear so 
Record number of parents fined last year over term time holidays. I think this is both a big deal and very bad, but I need teachers to either support or refute that. And I, I, I think I will be a little bit patronising for, for, for once. And I will say that um, I think a lot of parents don't realise what a bad thing it is that they're doing. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 17 minutes after 11, we'll take Prince Harry's lawyer's statement in full shortly and catch up with Evan Harris from Hacked Off, who is um, very close to all of the cases alleging phone hacking against British newspaper groups. This is a very, very big deal because normally the groups, the newspaper groups, manage to make the allegations go away. Um, uh, through a variety of means without ever admitting wrongdoing. Uh, on this occasion, they can't do that because the judges found that they did wrong. And uh, the, the, the ramifications and the significance of that will um, take a while to process, actually. There'll be an awful lot of sweaty palms on what we used to call Fleet Street today. 18 minutes after 11 is the time. Corpsey is one of my oldest and most trusted correspondents. Um, I, I used to read his emails on the program before Twitter was even invented. But he has now tweeted me and he said, fines mean it's legal if you can afford it. The half term markup is so preposterous that paying the fines can be cheaper and a holiday can be better for a child's development than a week in school. And uh, it is a testament to the quality of his contributions over the last 20 years that he's made me think I might have got this wrong. But I don't think I have. Not yet. Laura is in Stamford in Lincolnshire. Laura, what would you like to say? Um, just that recently I took my two little boys to Lapland, which was um, amazing, obviously. It's a, a holiday of a lifetime for us, um, which meant that they would miss two days school. Um, but I sort of factored in the fact that we probably would get a fine, as yet I haven't. Um, so it would so, well, be 200, uh, 120 quid, would it be one yeah. per child? Yeah, exactly, um, which isn't an awful lot to pay for something as special as that. And um, how much would, would have, was there a big price difference between doing the trip during the Christmas holidays and doing yeah, it during term huge. time? Yeah, I mean, How big? Obviously, there's only a certain time of the year you can go and do that. Yes. Um, so we did it the last weekend in November, but it, it ramped up, you know, nearly three times the price to go. Three to times later. the price? Yeah. Oh. Um, and also, being a, a single parent, I've had holidays in, in previously where I've had to take them in school time because it meant either I couldn't go if we were to go in term time. I couldn't afford it to go in the holidays, but I could afford I, a week. I, I'm going to regret doing this one, aren't I? Because I, 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 well, I'm, because I think I did it before therapy the last time I did this subject. <laughs> and I've changed so much since I had therapy because, I, I, you know, I would have said, and I'm still going to say it, but I'm saying it through the recognition of how tin-eared it might sound i would have said laura what happened to the idea that if you can't afford something you can't have it oh yeah i completely agree what um <laughs> it, it, to a degree but it means that actually my children are missing out on a holiday yes um which you know when when you're on your own it's, on your own, it's quite hard to find the money anyway but it, it means that we can go away for a week in term time as opposed to not having a holiday for maybe three or four years and and the Lapland thing is a is a doozy, really, isn't it? Because well, that's it, it. I was given some money. My mum passed away, unfortunately. She gave oh, me a small sorry. amount of money. Oh, you're really um, you're really p boxing. I mean, I'm already in the on the ropes <laughs> now, and you've just swung a, a your mother yeah. passing away to hit I me just even harder. I wanted to do something really special that yes. I can make memories of my little boys, and that's what I chose to do. And it was worth a hundred and twenty pound fine if I got that. If you get it, and and yeah. there's part of me now that hopes you don't. No, nope, there's no. all of me. There's all of me that hopes you don't. <laughs> but the problem is that. That rules are rules, and yeah, albeit oh, yeah. that you're mit that. you're mitigating circumstances. It, if the head teacher was fully aware of them, particularly the fact that they've lost their grandma, the head teacher might have said that's fine. But my old fashioned self says it should be their decision, not yours. Yeah, and I think maybe a case on case basis would work better because everybody's situation now is very different. There's some truth in that as well. Although if you've got children at two different schools, you could end up having one head teacher saying, "Yeah, that's fine, yeah, bon voyage," well, and the yeah. other one saying, "No, I'm not yeah. going to let." Thank you. I, I needed I, no. I needed a grown-up explanation of why this isn't another black and white binary issue. And you know what? I sometimes pretend that I miss 
being able to treat these issues as black and white and binary, but I promise you that I don't. It makes better radio, and I'm a much healthier person for not actually being able to cling on to the saddle on my or the reins on my high horse. But I still think there's a problem here, and, and we will invite teachers to explain to us why. I think Alan Bromley's gone in a bit hard. Staggering, he writes. You only have this opinion because you can afford to have it. You might as well adopt the same accent as Rhys Mogg. Nobody has the same. Even Rhys Mogg doesn't have the same accent as Rhys Mogg. As soon as the door's shut behind him, he sounds like uh, Peggy Mitchell out of EastEnders. It's all put on. The, and the point is this, Al, and I, and I do mean this. That, listen, there are holidays that I can't afford during holiday time that I could afford during term time. It's just a question of turning the dial up on the holiday, isn't it? It's it's the question of how um, how much you can afford. Everyone can afford a better holiday than the one they went on if they went during term time instead of holiday time. So that's not really fair. I might be able to go to the Maldives or something and 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 rent a I don't know what a house with a waterfall in it. I don't know. But the things that I can't afford to do during the school holidays that I probably could, especially if it's as big a markup as the one Laura has described, that I um that I could afford during term time, but I don't do it. So it's not fair to say that I'm being ultra privileged. At least I don't think it is, Al. It's certainly not staggering, and I will never adopt the same accent as Jacob Rees-Mogg. Let's hear now from David Sherbone, who is the lawyer for the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, who has scored a staggering victory, I think, in the um, in the High Court today. This is, this is David Sherbone speaking outside the Royal Courts of Justice just a few moments ago. The court has ruled that unlawful and criminal activities were carried out at all three Mirror Group newspaper titles, The Mirror, The Sunday Mirror and The People, on a habitual and widespread basis for over more than a decade. I'd like to thank my legal team for so successfully dismantling the sworn testimony of Mirror Group's senior executives, legal department and journalists who at least turned up to court, unlike their colleagues who were perhaps too afraid to do so. This case is not just about hacking. It is about a systemic practice of unlawful and appalling behaviour, followed by cover-ups and destruction of evidence, the shocking scale of which can only be revealed through these proceedings. The court has found that Mirror Group's principal board directors, their legal department, senior executives and editors such as Piers Morgan clearly knew about or were involved in these illegal activities. Between them, they even went as far as lying under oath to Parliament during the Leveson inquiry, to the Stock Exchange and to us all ever since. The journey to justice can be a slow and painful one, and since bringing my claim almost five years ago, defamatory stories and intimidating tactics have been deployed against me and at my family's expense. And so, as I too have learned through this process, patience is in fact a virtue, especially in the face of vendetta journalism. I hope that the court's findings will serve as a warning to all media organisations who have employed these practices and then similarly lied about them. Mirror Group's actions were so calculated and misleading that their pattern of destroying evidence and concealing their unlawful behaviour continued into the litigation itself and, as the judge has ruled, even to this day. I am happy to have won the case, especially given that this trial only looked at a quarter of my entire claim. Even on just that, it is clear Mirror Group's persistent attempts to suggest that my claim was, to quote their counsel, fantastical, in the realms of total speculation, and there was simply no evidence at all to suggest I was hacked. Zilch, zero, nil, nada, niente, absolutely nothing. All of that was total nonsense and was used maliciously to attack my character and credibility. However, as Mirror Group intended, 
those hollow sound bites were blasted across front pages and across online platforms and into the next day's morning television shows. The court has in fact confirmed that all four claimants were subjected to voicemail interception and unlawful information gathering, but no one would have believed that was the case given how this trial was covered in the UK. My commitment to seeing this case through is based on my belief in our need and collective right to a free and honest press, and one which is properly accountable when necessary. That is what we need in Britain and across the globe. Anything else is poisoning the well for a profession we all depend on. The acts listed in this judgment are prime examples of what happens when the power of the press is abused. I respectfully call upon the authorities, the financial regulator, the stock market who were deliberately deceived by Mirror Group, and indeed the Metropolitan Police and prosecuting authorities to do their duty for the British public and to investigate bringing charges against the company and those who have broken the law. Today's ruling is vindicating and affirming. I've been told that slaying dragons will get you burned, but in light of today's victory and the importance of what is doing what is needed for a free and honest press, it is a worthwhile price to pay. The mission continues. Um, thank you. Thank you, Prince Harry. Uh, that is one of the most powerful distillations of why people like my father went into journalism. That, that is what the profession is supposed to do. And the corruption that has been visited upon that profession by a succession of proprietors and editors is a national tragedy. Um, it damages the very fabric of a nation as Prince Harry is one of the only public figures with the courage to say so out loud because a heck of a lot of people know it in private. But he has the courage to say it out loud and, and quite possibly wouldn't have done or wouldn't even have worked it out were it not for the appalling abuses visited upon him and his young family, particularly, of course, his wife, although the hacking offences took place long before he met Meghan Markle. That, that I found that surprisingly moving, actually. Uh, I, I, I think his motivation for doing it is as much public duty and public service as it is personal, <clears throat> personal animus. That was an absolutely beautiful analysis of just how much damage has been done to our dem democracy by unregulated, out-of-control so-called journalists. And absolutely extraordinary. And the attempts to humiliate him, malign him, libel him, undermine him, abuse him, have been legion. I've never seen anybody. I haven't seen serial killers come in for as much abuse from British newspapers and some broadcasters as Prince Harry has. I genuinely haven't seen... So. Not in terms of the regularity, because a serial killer will be in the spotlight for a fortnight or for the length of a trial or the length of an investigation. But the idea that they'd come back to Prince Harry with the vilest of accusations and the vilest of allegations and the vilest of coverage again and again and again and again is, I think, unique. And he has just smashed them right where it hurts. And uh, I'll tell you something for nothing. It's not over yet. Thomas Watts is here now with the headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where the news from the High Court is that Prince Harry has succeeded in his case, along with three others, um, in his case against Mirror Group newspapers. Evan Harris is a, direct, a former director of the Hacked Off campaign, which has been one of the driving forces behind the attempts to rein in some of the worst criminal excesses of British newspapers and has indeed been in court this morning. And Dr Harris joins us now. Um, it's hard to know where to start, Evan. So it is indeed. I, I, I mean, several, I suppose judgment several hundred pages. Yes. Yeah, so do you, are you telling me you haven't read it yet? 
I haven't read it, but I've read Ridiculous. a digest and I've heard the judge digesting well, it. Well, let, let, let me start with a simplistic question. How big's my bingo card. How, how big a deal is this? Very big. I mean, it, it's, it's highly significant, not just in respect to Prince Harry, where much of the media attention will focus, but on the more general uh, or what are called generic findings, which were that editors knew about the, the um, phone hacking and the other unlawful activity, encouraged it, hid it and lied about it. And he names names in the judgment. And you can guess one of the names. He's quite explicit about that. And I'll read you a bit so I can stick to the wording of the judge in a minute. He also found that the board knew, or at least the chief executive, Sly Bailey, and the head of legal and the company secretary, Paul Vickers, knew about this in the latter case from 2003 and in the former case from 2006 and didn't do anything about it, didn't stop it mm -hmm. and therefore gave evidence to the Leveson inquiry that was not true. I mean, I'm putting it politely. Yes. Um, and in addition, um, uh, Prince Harry was awarded aggravated damages for the fact that this could have been stopped and they were concealing it. Um, so that's highly significant. The... Um, the, some of the wording, for example, um, around, um, around Piers Morgan is this. The judge said, I found Mr. Scobie, that's Omid Scobie, who, separate from writing his book, was a witness uh, who said that he saw and heard Piers Morgan talk about phone hacking on the 3AM desk when he was doing work experience there. It says, I found Mr. Scobie to be a straightforward and reliable witness and accept what he said about Mr. Morgan's involvement in the... Kylie Minogue slash Gooding story. No evidence was called by Mirror Group to contradict it. And later he said, the inference is an obvious one. Ms. Cantor, that's Ulrika's agent's mm. phone, and the phones of her associates were hacked, and the obviously confidential and sensitive information obtained was passed to Mr. Morgan. This is about uh, Sven Joran Eriksson, as you know, who must have known how it had been obtained and made use of it. Now, there's other references as well. This is what and the judge has written it. That's right. That's verbatim from the judgment. And that's the judge saying that he has found, proven, that Piers Morgan knew about this activity and used it. And that is a flat contradiction of, A, what he always says when attacking the people who are often people who are suing his old newspaper and criticising him, and in contradiction to what he said at the Leveson inquiry, which, remember, was evidence given on oath. This is the offence that Andy Coulson went to jail for? Well, Andy Coulson went to jail for phone hacking. What is alleged against Piers Morgan and others is not just that, but effectively the, the perversion of the course of justice, what Americans call obstruction of justice. Because if you um, because don't Levison tell the truth under oath... Because was a, was a judge-led well, judge inquiry. Yes, there's, there's a perjury-type offence in the Inquiries Act, but also um, the police were not told the truth because there was a police investigation into the mirror, which decided to take no action. So altogether, there's a clear evidence, and Prince Harry in his statement read by his barrister outside court said that he expects the authorities to now do their job and investigate these individuals. And the judge made it clear that, you know, Piers Morgan could have come to court and he either didn't want to, or Mirrored Group didn't feel they could put him on the stand to give truthful evidence. And therefore, there's no getting away from this. He can bluff and bluster all he likes, there is a judicial finding against him that is extremely serious. What, what, I, 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 again, hard to know where to start unpicking this, but what, I mean, what were the Mirror Group hoping would happen? I know they were hoping that, that, that they wouldn't be on the hook in the way that they are, but what, what, what did their defence sound like? Because most people are going to be catching up with the detail of this case from the judgment as it's been handed down and from what you've shared with us and what we've covered already, it looked like an open and shut case. So what, what was the Mirror Group defence in court? Well, well, there were many issues at stake and yes. there was a crumb of comfort for them in some of the judgments which I'll deal with. First on Prince Harry their position was zero of the 140 articles that he alleges were obtained unlawfully, of which a sample of 33 were considered by the judge. Ah. Zero were the result of this activity, and the judge found that 15 were proven of the 33, mm. which you can scale up to 60, of the 140, that's a lot of articles, were found to be a result of this, and awarded him just for the 33, that fraction of the 140, £160,000 in damages. Now, Mirror thought that, A, they would 
presumably they thought that they could show that there was no hacking. Yes. They might have thought that they would get away with not being found that their senior executives and legal department knew about this and they lost on that. Um, but their, part of their aim, I think it's fair to say, was to say that these cases are too late, that the six-year limit from when you find out about it to bringing it. And two of the claims fell into that six-year delay and the judge did dismiss those two claims. Now, I don't know whether, whether that will be appealed. It's certainly a controversial ruling. Um, and, but they can say, look, uh, a lot of people should have known by 2015 when the first trial took place that this was happening and therefore uh, the, there should be no more cases brought. Now, that, that's the crumb of comfort that they can take, but it's come at a huge price for their corporate or the corporate governance uh, judgment of their predecessor company mm. uh, and at a huge cost in terms of findings, widespread findings of illegality. Uh, including, by the way, the judge was explicit. I find that hacking and other act legal activity carried on up to at least 2011, even during the Leveson inquiry. Did that surprise even, you? That did surprise me. Yeah, me, me too. <laughs> I, well, I've seen the evidence, so I'm not sure. surprised. But I was, but I when was you first saw pleased it. to see that the judge got that. Yes. So even, it, even it, it as... It did surprise me when I first saw it, yes. I, I, yeah, I'm I sure it did. they would have you know, closed shop and tried to limit the damage. But they just felt so much impunity. And this is the problem, because the press... As, you, as you've made the point yourself, the press don't report on the press. If mm. this was any other industry, any other company, there would be calls for resignations from the press uh, and for the police to take action. But that's the one thing you won't get from most of our newspapers. Um, uh, uh, as someone I know who was a, has been a, a, a victim of phone hacking and who has been compelled to, to reach a settlement um, uh, described it to me as discovering that hacking phones was, was like taking the lid off a pen for, 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 for a huge number of journalists throughout all of this period. And uh, we'll get on shortly to the very important fact that this is only one of a, of, a, of a clutch of cases that Prince Harry is bringing against a variety of newspaper groups. But before we do that... And I, I don't know whether I'm, I'm leading you off your uh, er, areas where you feel com confident and qualified, but this, this quote here, clearly, uh, you've alluded to, respectfully, Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex, respectfully calls on authorities, the financial regulator, stock markets, and the metropolitan police and prosecuting authorities to do their duty for the British public and investigate bringing charges against the company and those who broke the law. Um, can, can you, on, on a very personal perspective can you conceive of circumstances in which they wouldn't do that i can conceive right. it because we've seen it before we saw it in 2006 when clive goodman and glenn mulcair were arrested and they said it was one rogue reporter and just yes. some royal stuff yet at the same time there were people like el mcpherson and gordon taylor of pfa who were definitely not royal whatever you may think of them mm. whose cases were in that case and then we saw in 2011 after that, that they gave up prosecuting the mirror and didn't get to the bottom uh, in respect of Mr. Murdoch's company of what we allege is widespread concealment uh, uh, and cover up by again making the same mm. false statements on oath and also destroying evidence. So, so yes, there is a history of this, and of course, you've got politicians, many of whom are craven, even either because they're fearful of bad coverage, or because they think wrongly that they can curry favour, because the one thing I, I admire about uh, some of our press is that they, they, uh, they won't, do, they won't yes. do the bidding of politicians, even if they say they will. They're like scorpions. They will eventually uh, sting you as they carry you across the, 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 the pond. Um, and so you've got a... Uh, so there, is, there are circumstances. However, I think with the fact that you've got Prince Harry as a high-profile person, that you've got his action still against newsgroup newspapers due for trial in, in just over a year's time and right. permission to proceed against the mail, that the combination of those should prevent politicians from blocking the actions or seeking to block or putting pressure on the prosecution authorities and the police to um, uh, not to do their job. And the police should know that they cannot repeat the errors of the past that you know, this should never have reached this stage because it should have been properly investigated 18 years ago and it never was. But as I say, I think there's a real risk and we have to, the public have to demand action.
and and just run through the the cases not not let's leave the libel cases out of it and look at the yes. the, 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 the 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 illegal information cases he's got one coming up against associated newspapers the owners of the daily that's mail right. that's alongside doreen lawrence elizabeth hurley sadie frost and simon hughes and, and he's that's got in its early stages but was given permission to proceed because the mail tried to strike it out as too late so even though we weren't doing it he should have known we were doing it early and then the news group newspapers one which harry is bringing with hugh grant and um there's uh, 50 other people and 50 other that. people so that that, that um that's that, due for trial um, if it doesn't settle yes. um, next January. And as you point out, people, if they're given large offers, have to settle or go bankrupt, as you've expl- I've heard you explain this before. Yes. Because if you don't beat your offer in court, you end up having to pay the costs of the other side. And your insurers won't allow you to proceed if you're clearly not going to beat that offer, unless you have a huge amount of money and are prepared to take that loss. Um, and it remains to be seen whether there's anyone in this group that will reject the... Um, that the, will, they will take that risk, or, or rather accept... From, from ex- Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, He's uh, spent over a billion dollars so far in paying off people to avoid a trial. So why didn't that happen in this case, in the Mirror case? Well, because Mirror is a PLC, reaches yes. a PLC, so that they have some corporate responsibility uh, uh, currently, and they can't throw that sort of money oh. at these cases. And also they thought they had a chance of running limitation. Now, news group newspapers have the same opportunity to try and get a ruling on limitation, but that would require them to go to trial. And th- whatever happened to Piers Morgan today mm. is, in my view, nothing like what would happen to his equivalent executives at news group where the evidence, I say, we say, and yes. we plead in publicly available documents is even stronger than took place uh, in the mirror. And that's why. Rupert Murdoch is no fool. Mm. He knows that he has to spend over a billion uh, pounds, actually, now. (laughs) It's gone up. There was another one last week, wasn't there? There was a big settlement. Indeed, yeah. uh, Chris Chris Hugh, the former cabinet minister's phone was hacked while he was dealing with national security. Although News news Corps, News Group, as they were, insist that they didn't do anything wrong, even as they pay out these billion six Total figure sums, sums. Yeah. exactly that's the point but but obviously people can see that they're paying for a reason now they're either paying they're not paying because they think they're guilty they're paying to avoid being found guilty by preventing these cases coming to court so to avoid, say, i think i'm worried about my lawyers now to avoid the possibility of being found guilty when, they, when these cases come to court to avoid any findings being made yes to avoid any look, findings look, being made yes. there we go there it is so this is Crikey. So, I mean, under your reading of it, this isn't the biggest um, of, of the three balls that no, are rolling. the smallest the, of the, the three. The balls that are rolling. Um, and, and we are in the foothills then, really, both in terms of impact and time. Because, as you say, it's January 2025 for one of them and, and not even certain that the other one will go to trial. So, ha- ha- Prince Harry clearly in this for the long haul. Yes, and I think he said that... Um, you know, because obviously he's paid a price, as he says in his statement, that, you know, that there's the journalism of vengeance being used against him, because whenever they attack him, and, you know, you can decide whether it's worth worthy or not, they never say that they're a defendant in a case he's brought, which you really ought to do if you're being transparent about your conflicts of interests. They never do. Um, and uh, they attack um, someone who was a guest, I think, on your podcast, Omid Scobie. Mm. They attack... Piers Morgan laid into him on social media and his and his Murdoch TV platform without ever saying that Omid Scobie was a sworn witness against Piers Morgan in this mirror trial. And the judge has sided with, who heard the evidence, has sided with Omid Scobie. You don't hear that. This That's is dishonest yes. journalism. I, well, I, I, as in and no, 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 no full disclosure in, in terms of the technical term as opposed to the podcast. So, I, I, again, from a personal perspective, how likely is it that Mr. Morgan's going to get his collar felt then? Well, I, 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 can't, I can't predict. No. Uh, he's, he has been a Houdini for some time, but this is the first time, I think it's right to say, that a judge has made findings that he carried out criminal activity. I mean, I've read you some of the elements, there are more. You have, yes. Uh, so I'm on safe ground saying that. And furthermore, it therefore follows, as night follows day, that he must have misled... Uh, and given untrue statements to the Leveson inquiry, which was under oath. 
and he's still misleading the public in his protestations at the moment. He's never taken the opportunity to be cross-examined on this, and therefore, um, if the police do their job properly and the prosecution services without interference from newspapers attacking them or client politicians of newspaper owners mm. um, putting pressure on the, the police, and it's an operational matter, clearly, so there shouldn't be that interference, then uh, he should uh, be prosecuted, and he's entitled to a fair trial. Absolutely. Um, but he should, proceedings should be taken, in my view, and as implied by um, Prince Harry's statement in his view, but that's not just him. Anyone who knows the history of what's gone on here recognise that it cannot be right to have a public inquiry where people don't appear to have, according to a judge, told the truth under oath. Because what's wh where the point, do we go? What's the point that? of judge-led inquiries um, or public inquiries if, if, if they don't and are, are found exactly. not to have done so? And it's don't caustic face... to the rule of law. Yes, it is. It's caustic to our politics and it's caustic to uh, 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 tr transparency in public discourse. It's 10 to 12. Have we covered everything you feel we should have covered at this point, Evan? No, but I think we've covered enough for most <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, we may catch up with you later in the, in, in, or, or next week. Dr. Evan Harris, former director of the Hacked Off campaign, which has been providing assistance and support to many, if not all, of the claimants in all of these cases. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.57 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, I mean, incredible breaking news in the course of the programme this morning. Prince Harry found to be a victim of phone hacking by Mirror Group newspapers, uh, awarded £140,600 in damages. Some of his... Um, uh, I, I, what, is it fellow plaintiffs, co-plaintiffs? Some of the other people bringing the case with him also getting their results through as well, including the Coronation Street actor Michael Turner, who <laughs> you're going you're to think I've looked this up or that I've, I've checked it, but I don't need to. He plays Kevin Webster and his stage name is Michael Lavelle. He has, uh, the court has concluded that he was also a victim of some unlawful gathering of his personal information. He's picked up £31,650 in damages. But as I think Prince Harry's statement made crystal clear, it's certainly not about the money um, for, for, for him and many of the other people bringing these cases. It's about justice. Mr Justice Fancourt found that Turner was targeted by Mirror Group journalists in 2011 when he was facing prosecution over an alleged crime he was later found not guilty of committing. Four articles proven to be linked to phone hacking or other unlawful information gathering. Um, the, the, the way it worked, and I've... I've I'm not making light of anything when I say this, but but it has helped me to understand why I was such a bad show business journalist, discovering the extent of phone hacking that has gone on and, and, and did go on and went on has come as an enormous shock to me. But I've been obviously talking to people about how it worked, victims of it, and they, they wouldn't just check your own phone. They'd check the phones of anyone whose number they got hold of as a consequence of hacking your phone so partners family members therapists doctors i i, I mean that the, the sheer scale of it as it has been explained to me and i'm talking generically now i'm not talking about any specific cases but the sheer scale of it is 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 i mean not even close to being fully understood by really anybody except those who've been caught in the jaws of it for the best part in some cases of, of 20 odd years James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Oh boy! Three minutes after twelve is the time, and I've got I've got ninety nine problems, but this ain't one. Is that how the song goes? Is it? The, uh, um, I, my my sense is that this is a story that we should be talking about for the rest of our program. But my memory is that you didn't care about phone hacking until it emerged that Millie Dowler's phone had been hacked. I am a former newspaper journalist. I am the son of a newspaper journalist. I am in constant um, uh, consciousness of how few people 
who have worked for British newspapers and who have ink in their blood have been open and uh, honest about how awful their influence upon the body politic in this country has become. You may on occasion have heard me mention Paul Dacre, for example, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail. Um, and I'm not talking about phone hacking now. I'm talking about the disgusting treatment of people like Dominic Grieve, who is my guest on Full Disclosure this week and who shared a story with me that I hadn't been aware of about what the Daily Mail did to him during that little period when they were calling democratically M uh, elected MPs saboteurs who must be crushed, and they were calling high court judges enemies of the people, and they were attacking academic freedom and um, all manner of uh, e essential platforms of, of British democracy and British values. So uh, there aren't many of us who slag off British newspapers, um, and that there certainly aren't many who've got, got a book out at the moment that goes into a lot of detail about how awful those newspapers have been. But but that I'm mentioning all of that partly to plug the book, How They Broke Britain, at least three chapters on precisely the mess that British newspapers have inflicted upon the population. But there's one vote in already for an hour-long monologue. Keith, I've told you to stop texting the programme. Uh, I, I, I know how much you enjoy me speaking uninterrupted on a subject, but I don't know if it's fair upon everybody else. I, I, I also know that when phone hacking first became a phrase with which the British public was becoming familiar, you didn't really like talking about it. I, I, I mean, I should probably caveat that with the fact that the audience for this programme was about a fifth of the size of what it is now, but... But I don't think that's the point. Um, there are lots of um, uh, uh, things that you can tell whether people are going to be talking about it or not. Um, I'm also getting messages. My phone is pinging from people either involved in or adjacent to a variety of the cases that are currently being talked about um, uh, six minutes after 12 is the time. But... But I think today is different, and I think it's about Prince Harry in the first instance rather than newspapers. And I think that if you are honest with yourself, you will now begin to understand why Prince Harry has come under such vitriolic and sustained attack from the most influential media outlets in this country. I, 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 I think that many people who are decent members of the public as opposed to this profession must be realizing that they have been sold an almighty and hideous pup because that thing evan harris said there about newspapers writing articles about prince harry people raging endlessly about prince harry and and his wife without revealing that they were involved in or implicated in cases, court cases, allegations of criminal misdeeds that Prince Harry was bringing to court. Do you imagine if I weighed in on someone on this program without mentioning to you that they were currently engaged in legal action that could see me in very, very serious trouble? Imagine all the times you've heard me be critical of, I don't know, Nadine Dorries, say, for being such an awful, awful politician and profoundly unpleasant human being. Imagine if I'd done all of that to you and then you found out that actually she was suing me for something that I had actually done. And I'd never mentioned it to you once. Or, or, or you know, it, I'd been a fully paid up member of, a, of an empire that was being sued by Prince Harry, either as a, as a former executive or editor on the Daily Mirror or the News of the World or The Sun or whatever it had been, and I had been attacking this person without telling you that everybody in my contacts book, all of my former colleagues and friends were absolutely terrified of where these cases might lead. So that today is a really, really important observation to make i think eight minutes after 12 is the time I, I don't know if i can do a phone in on the question of whether or not you would like to say sorry to prince harry <laughs> i'm quite tempted because the vitriol about social media uh, uh, just following where legacy media has led the vitriol has been extraordinary and they were stealing his private information from his phone 
the Mirror Group. We can't say that about any of the other organisations that he is still involved in legal action against. But it is absolutely extraordinary, this result. And, and I resisted the urge to go in hard when it first dropped because, as, as I said, I needed a little bit of guidance and a little bit of counsel on what uh, on how big a deal it actually was. But I just want you to pause for a minute and think about the reason why they have been so horrible to him. Just think about it, because we, we've done phone-ins on that. We did it with Gary Lineker last week. Do you remember? So why does Gary Lineker boil, I think it was on Monday actually, boil the gamini urine of this country in such a vicious, vicious and vi in such a violent way? Why does Gary Lineker annoy people so much? And the answer is very, very simply that he's a bloke with decent opinions, compassionate humanitarian opinions that the right-wing media has successfully squeezed out of the public space almost completely. So someone with a big platform comes along and speaks up in favour of decency, humanity and compassion, it makes them feel ashamed and ugly and disgusting and so they're desperate to silence him. Now Harry's that times 10, so you take that, times it by 10, because he is bringing the fight to their doorstep. And I do believe that an awful lot of the treatment that he's received over the last few years has been designed to try to persuade him to stop. I know that he believes this, to bully him into silence. If you think what you've been through so far is bad, you better just take a look at this. Oh, and by the way, nice wife you've got there, be a shame if something happened to her. That's how bad it is. That is what they've done. That is what they've done. They have sought to dissuade him from pursuing these legal actions by showing him that things can get even worse than they were when, in the case of Mirror Group newspapers and allegedly other organisations, they were hacking his phone on a regular basis, stealing his, his private information. I'll tell you a story about another victim of phone hacking, and I, I don't think I can name them because I'm not sure what the precise situation was upon... Um, upon settlement, but I know for a fact that one famous woman believed that her own sister was selling stories about her to a newspaper. And the reason why she believed that her own sister was selling stories about her to a newspaper was that a newspaper published a story that only her sister knew about. Now, these were sisters who were tight and who were close, and it sent this famous woman, it almost sent her mad. Imagine that. Think of someone you really trust and love. Go on. Just think of them. Oh, that's sweet, Keith. Um, think of someone you really love and trust, okay? And you told them something, and you knew that you hadn't told anybody else. And then they left a message on your phone about it because they'd found out something or they had some useful advice for you and uh, they, they were getting on a plane or you didn't pick up or whatever it may have been, you left a message on their phone referencing this revelation, this deep, deep secret, this deep personal secret that you had spoken to nobody else about. And then you get a call from your agent or your publicist to say, I don't know how, but the Daily Bugle have got hold of a story, or, or, or they've just called me up to ask about a story that even your publicist didn't know about. That's how secret it was. You hadn't even given your publicist, this is how the industry works, you hadn't even given your publicist a heads up about something that you really didn't want to come out. Say, a, a pregnancy, for example, or something like that. Even your publicist didn't know. So you cut your sister out of your life. You turned on your sister. What does the mum do? What do mum and dad do? And one daughter swears blind that the only way this story could have found its way into the newspapers was if my own sister betrayed me. And the other daughter swears blind that she would never in a million years tell a soul. But you've got Occam's razor kicking in. You've got the Sherlock Holmes principle, haven't you? There is the impossible has been eliminated and whatever you are left with, however improbable, must be the truth. Unless there's something that wouldn't have crossed anybody's mind at all. Because outside of Fleet Street, nobody knew about phone hacking. And so those sisters remained estranged 
and at loggerheads. That family remained fractured until the truth emerged, until the reality of phone hacking began to be reported and until people were contacted privately to be told by lawyers and police officers in some cases that their phones had been hacked. And, a, and another story I have for you, which is absolutely breathtaking, and it involves some famous woman, a famous woman, being spotted coming out of a gynecology clinic on Harley Street. This isn't phone hacking. This is another practice by which people unlawfully get hold of information. And that meant that to the person who was following this famous person around, that meant that there was obviously a story with a gynecological dimension. And an hour or th three after that famous woman had left that clinic, somebody claiming to be her rang the clinic and asked for details of the test. That she, a complete flyer. Hi, it's, uh, it's James. It's James. I was just wondering if you got the results of the test that I did earlier. Except it's not James. It's someone completely different. And they get the results of the test. And it was a pregnancy test for a pregnancy that that famous person wanted to terminate. And they obviously didn't want anybody anywhere in the world to know that they were having a termination. And that ended up in the paper as well. It's 12.15. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.16 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, so let's find out. Let's find out whether you want to talk about it or not, because you didn't used to. You used to find phone hacking really quite boring. But um, we now know that Prince Harry's phone and some of the other people bringing this legal action with him, they were unlawfully hacked. We know that some household name journalists have been named by the judge as uh, as being involved in the hacking uh, one of them that possibly the most vitriolic and unhinged critic of Prince Harry and particularly his wife Meghan um, in the entire firmament of the British media uh, I speak of Piers Morgan um, whose career it's fair to say has been unaffected by all manner of allegation and scandal over, over the course of the last two or three decades. Um, some more breaking news for you. Two of the other claimants in the mirror hacking case have lost their battle on legal technical grounds. This is even though there was evidence that they had been victims of unlawful intrusion. The judge, Justice Fancourt, said that Nikki Sanderson and Fiona Whiteman um, had both run out of time. So the law says that damages claims must start within six years of the victim first suspecting that they may have a case to pursue. And both Sanderson and Whiteman had left it too late. However, the judge added that both the women had nevertheless been victims of unlawful information gathering. And remember that um, Fiona Whiteman is not even famous. She's not a public figure. And her... Uh, um, uh, involvement, for want of a better word, in, in this case, was born entirely of the fact that she used to be married to one. She was married to Paul Whitehouse. So what I told you a moment ago about them hacking the phones of anybody, any number they could get hold of, if you were in any way in contact with somebody newsworthy, she is, she is quite a good example of. So let's just find out. 18 minutes after 12. Does this verdict, does this judgment change the way you think about Prince Harry? That's the question that I want you to answer if you can. And, and, and you know that I'm a bit of a bore when it comes to the manipulation of good people by bad journalists. It's huge. It's, a, it's an absolutely essential part of the content for the con men, compassion for the con mantra that, that we try to live by on this program. But the, 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 the question of why this man has been so horribly pursued by British newspapers has now in large part been answered. And I just want to know what you make of that. It's 19 minutes after 12. If you don't want to talk about it, we will go back to the question of taking kids out of school during term time, which is actually one of my most favorite subjects. I do find it absolutely fascinating and I can feel my old certainties beginning to shift. So, so it cuts both ways for you. I'm going to play you David Sherbourne's um, Start reading out of Prince Harry's state statement again, and then I want you to tell me whether or not this changes your view of Prince Harry. And it's quite a big question to ask because it's, you know, change 
is slow and, and you may not have fully absorbed what's gone on or you may not have fully understood what's gone on. But but trust me, it's a very, very big deal and it's a very, very helpful explainer of why Prince Harry has come in for such unprecedented abuse from almost every corner of the British media. So the number you need is 0345 6060 973. And when you listen to this, I want you to reflect upon the fact that he is claiming that he also did it for you. Because the full understanding of how rancid the influence of British newspapers has been over the last few years, and it's got a hell of a lot worse over the last 10, um, that is actually a matter of public duty and public service. It's something I passionately believe as well, even if, even if you sometimes feel like... Uh, as they say about prophets that never believed in their own land. So have a listen again to uh, Prince Harry's lawyer, David Sherborne, reading out a statement from the Duke of Sussex after his... I mean, uh, as, as some commentators have already said, if one of these uh, stories had been found to be based on illegally obtained information, that would have been a victory for Prince Harry. But um, it, was, it was 15 out of a sample of 33, so, you know, almost half of the stories that were cited um, picked up in court. Uh, 21 minutes after 12. Have another listen to this and then give me a call and tell me whether or not it's changed your view of print. Or no, or tell, just tell me what you think about living in a country where newspapers can do this to the king's son. The court has ruled that unlawful and criminal activities were carried out at all three Mirror Group newspaper titles, The Mirror, The Sunday Mirror and The People, on a habitual and widespread basis for over more than a decade. I'd like to thank my legal team for so successfully dismantling the sworn testimony of Mirror Group's senior executives, legal department and journalists who at least turned up to court, unlike their colleagues who were perhaps too afraid to do so. This case is not just about hacking. It is about a systemic practice of unlawful and appalling behaviour, followed by cover-ups and destruction of evidence, the shocking scale of which can only be revealed through these proceedings. The court has found that Mirror Group's principal board directors, their legal department, senior executives and editors such as Piers Morgan clearly knew about or were involved in these illegal activities. Between them, they even went as far as lying under oath to Parliament during the Leveson inquiry, to the Stock Exchange and to us all ever since. The journey to justice can be a slow and painful one, and since bringing my claim almost five years ago, defamatory stories and intimidating tactics have been deployed against me and at my family's expense. And so, as I too have learned through this process, patience is in fact a virtue, especially in the face of vendetta journalism. I hope that the court's findings will serve as a warning to all media organisations who have employed these practices and then similarly lied about them. Mirror Group's actions were so calculated and misleading that their pattern of destroying evidence and concealing their unlawful behaviour continued into the litigation itself and, as the judge has ruled, even to this day. I am happy to have won the case, especially given that this trial only looked at a quarter of my entire claim. Even on just that, it is clear Mirror Group's persistent attempts to suggest that my claim was, to quote their counsel, fantastical, in the realms of total speculation, and there was simply no evidence at all to suggest I was hacked. Zilch, zero, nil, nada, niente, absolutely nothing. All of that was total nonsense and was used maliciously to attack my character and credibility. However, as Mirror Group intended, 
those hollow sound bites were blasted across front pages and across online platforms and into the next day's morning television shows. The court has in fact confirmed that all four claimants were subjected to voicemail interception and unlawful information gathering, but no one would have believed that was the case given how this trial was covered in the UK. My commitment to seeing this case through is based on my belief in our need and collective right to a free and honest press, and one which is properly accountable when necessary. That is what we need in Britain and across the globe. Anything else is poisoning the well for a profession we all depend on. The acts listed in this judgment are prime examples of what happens when the power of the press is abused. I respectfully call upon the authorities, the financial regulator, the stock market who were deliberately deceived by Mirror Group, and indeed the Metropolitan Police and prosecuting authorities to do their duty for the British public and to investigate bringing charges against the company and those who have broken the law. Today's ruling is vindicating and affirming. I've been told that slaying dragons will get you burned, but in light of today's victory and the importance of what is doing what is needed for a free and honest press, it is a worthwhile price to pay. The mission continues. Just sort of thinking about the uh, statement that he must also have written in preparation for losing uh, and, 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 and how that one would have been phrased. 12.26 is the time. Um, I, I think there's some grim breaking news for you now. You'll be aware of the missing Norwich woman, Gaynor Lord. Uh, Helen Hodinot is, is in Norwich by the River Wensum. Helen, what can you tell us? Well, James, it has just been confirmed by Norwich Police that the body of 55-year-old mum of three, Gaynor Lord, has been found in the River Wensum a week after her belongings were discovered scattered around the park that uh, the river runs alongside on Friday evening. A statement we've just had through from police says officers searching for missing Norwich woman Gaynor Lord can confirm a body has been found in the River Wensum. The body was found in the river by underwater search teams this morning and has now been recovered from the water. While the body hasn't formally been identified, Gaynor's family have been informed. They continue to be supported by specially trained officers. Now, what we've noticed here at the river is that this morning, the focus of the police investigation shifted a few hundred metres uh, down river, closer towards Norwich city centre. And now we have had this confirmed uh, that a body has been found. Helen Hodinock there live in Norwich where, as you hear, a body's just been found uh, in, in the River Wensum, which was being searched by police scuba divers investigating the disappearance of the 55-year-old mother of three, Gaynor Lord, uh, 28 minutes after 12 is the time. We return to the, to the um, I mean, it puts stuff in perspective, actually, doesn't it? Um, the uh, family of, of Gaynor Lord, but quite possibly, probably dealing with the worst imaginable news uh, in, in the course of today. But we return to the other big story of uh, the morning, the finding the judgment at the High Court that Prince Harry's phone was hacked. And, and you, I'm worried about lawyers. That's why I'm sounding a little bit... Uh, hesitant on something, so you'd be 100% clear on what you can and can't say, but h here it is. Piers Morgan knew about phone hacking and was involved when he was editor of the Daily Mirror. The High Court has ruled in a highly significant part of the judgment. Mr. Fan Justice Fancourt lists times when Morgan was said to have been aware of phone hacking and the evidence had not been contested. He also said that he found evidence about Morgan's involvement to be credible and it had not been countered by the Mirror Group. Morgan, of course, cast doubts upon Meghan Markle's um, uh, 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 revelation, I don't think. I'm looking for a better word than that. Me Meghan Markle's revealing that she had suffered suicidal thoughts during her time at the palace. And of course, there is only one way in which someone accused of lying about having suicidal thoughts can prove their critics wrong. During a 
key part of the case, uh, the now royal author Omid Scobie, who was my guest on Full Disclosure a couple of weeks ago, recalled an incident he had witnessed when he was a student intern at the newspaper group working on its 3am girls entertainment desk. He told the court that in 2002, he had witnessed Morgan discuss an article about Kylie Minogue and Morgan, the then editor, had asked the journalist how confident they were about the story. Morgan was told, Scobie recalled, that the source had been a voicemail. Mr Justice Fancourt said that recollection was supported by evidence of an invoice from a private investigator related to obtaining Minogue's mobile phone number and that of her then partner James Gooding. Scobie said that the incident had stuck in his mind because it had influenced the decisions he made about what kind of journalist he wanted to be. Uh, Your thoughts on this remarkable story and the effect it might have had on your opinions of either Prince Harry, the British media or... uh, I, 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 I mean, I suppose the British newspaper industry in general. Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.33 is the time. Joe made me laugh during the break. She said, can these hackers access WhatsApps as well? I'm, I'm asking for a friend. Yes, you, it's remarkable really, isn't it, that the British media has the capacity to listen to your voicemails without you knowing, but we apparently can't get hold of the WhatsApps that were exchanged by the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer during a period of unprecedented peril for the country that they were uh, ostensibly governing. £140,600 in a phone hacking claim against the newspaper group um, MGN, uh, Mirror Group Newspapers, in the High Court, but I could tell you for nothing that the number, the money is negligible in the context of why Prince Harry brought this case and how he will be feeling today about its success. But in summary, Judge Fancourt said, I have accordingly awarded the Duke damages in respect of each of the articles and invoices where unlawful information gathering was provided. So how is it going to land with the great British public? Let's find out. The number you need is 0345 6060 973. Um, I've got some text, but I'll take some calls first. Chiron is in Chesterfield. Chiron, what would you like to say? Good afternoon, James. Nice to speak again. Um, you know, there's a, there's a line in a movie that's always stuck, to, stuck with me, and it, the line is, I know, you're a, I know you're a reporter, but you used to be a human being. Um, <laughs> That's a bit unkind. There's, there's another one, there's another one which you might like, which is you cannot hope to bribe or twist, thank God, the British journalist. But seeing what the man will do unbribed, there's no occasion to. But I don't like any of this because there are some good people in my profession. But as a, as a professional journalist yourself... This uh, must, I don't know about the professional must, bit. This must not sit well for you because, you know, so many of the British public you know, are going to be looking at this and they're going to be saying to themselves, we really can't trust a word that that, that comes out the mouths of these Well, this is people this has taken an unexpected turn. I think you can trust the words of people who've been calling out newspapers for these kind of excesses um, uh, for, mm. for, for, for most of their career. But does it change the way you feel about Prince Harry? <laughs> to be honest with you, I've always had sympathy uh, for Harry. Um, and... Um, you know, I mean, especially after what happened to his mother yes. uh, and, and everything else, I've always had tre- tremendous sympathy for him. But I think the re- one of the reasons why uh, these kind of stories are put out um, into the public is because, and, and, and there are many people that have been victims of this, but they simply do not have recourse because they can't afford it. You know, I mean, you have to have substantial funds to mount uh, a libel case. Um, and you really, I think you really is, do. I, I, and, and he has yeah. got a couple of libel cases outstanding. But even to, to contemplate a, a, a case like this, you, you, you need to be able to afford to lose is, is probably the best way of putting it. And as Evan Harris explained to us earlier, the way the system is set up means that if you, um, if you sued me for unlawful information gathering and we both knew that I was guilty but I offered you 200 grand to say all right I'll I'll leave it then and you knew that if it succeeded in court you were only going to get 100 grand or 50 grand then you'd have to accept it because if you insisted that we went to court and even if you won and the judge offered less than you'd been offered in the first place then you'd be liable for for 
uh, definitely for your own legal fees, which would run quite possibly into seven figures, and I think possibly for mine as well. And so that is why we find ourselves in this anomalous situation of media organisations paying, in the case of Rupert Murdoch's, over a billion pounds to people accusing them of unlawful information gathering, while the empire itself, Rupert Murdoch's empire, insists, even as it settles these cases, that it has done absolutely nothing wrong. It accepts no responsibility whatsoever. That's 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 changed today, partly because of the makeup, the corporate makeup of Mirror Group newspapers or Reach PLC as it is known now. So those decisions are not taken by individuals at the top of pyramids. They're, they're taken in, 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 in sort of boardrooms by people with responsibilities to shareholders. Thank you, Kyra. And Sarah's in Wimborne. Sarah, what, what made you pick up the phone? Well, um, you know, just looking at your question, I just feel that I have even more respect for Harry now and what he's been through, you know. It's sort of quite upsetting, isn't it, from what you're saying about how it really affects people's lives. Yes. What they go through enough as it is. And they're also standing up, I think, not just for himself, but for other people, which I really, really respect. You know, it's not, you know, I think he, he is that sort of person as his William, you know. So it's... Hang on a minute. Know, as his William? I, I might get my names wrong. I'm middle okay. aged. No, that's, quite, that's quite. Anyway, right. his family, the rest of his family, do tend to, you know, care about people. Well, you know, even well, that, 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 that may be the case, but they certainly haven't been very supportive of him in pursuing these cases against these media organisations. Right. Okay. No, they okay, really well, haven't. Well, quite the opposite, in fact. But what I did want to say yes. as well is, I would never buy the mail myself personally. It's not the mail; it's the mirror. Don't get me into trouble legally. The uh, the, <laughs> the, the 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 mail faces allegations and accusations, which um, uh, are are yet to come, as Evan Harris explained to us. Could be a year, could be two years away. Twelve thirty nine is the time. Thank you, Sarah. Rita is in Surbiton. Rita, I, I don't think we're going to get the transformations today. I don't think anyone who's been encouraged to hate Harry and his wife is going to ring in and start self flagellating and admitting that they made a terrible mistake but I think those of us who already held him in high regard may now hold him like Sarah explained in even higher regard than we did before. Same for me James but I just wanted to ask James you know that story you said about the two sisters is that true? Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you say is it true or did you name someone? No I said no I didn't name anybody. Oh good I'm yes asking. of course it's true of course it's true. You see and that is the thing that really touched me and changed me today, James. Really? Because I love my sister, James, and if anybody ever did that to us... Yes? I would... Oh, I couldn't survive it, James. So if that's happened to somebody and the, these people have done that... Yes? These people don't care how much they're hurting people. No, they don't at all. They don't, James, and that really brought it home to me, and I'm going to stop anything with Piers Morgan on in my house because of that... Oh, that's all I wanted to well, say. I think I think it yeah, puts you uh, uh, puts you in company of most of the co- most of the country already, doesn't it? As far as I can no, tell. No, there's this channel that. that he's on, it, James, and my da- 81 year old father's watching it at night time. Well, will it change his view? Your 81 well, year old father's. Um, yes, yes, I think it will when I speak to him. I think it definitely will because he's not seeing Piers Morgan on the telly anymore. Well, well, we shall see. I, 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 the, 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 the hasn't really previous problems haven't really affected his, um, his his career, but we shall see whether this one does. It is, I think, <clears throat> that was something that we picked up from Evan Harris. It is a, I, I, I mean, a, an unprecedented uh, statement from the judge in the in the context of named individuals. And of course, uh, Andy Coulson, who was a former editor of the News of the World, went to jail just for being involved in phone hacking as the editor of a of a newspaper. Uh, the, the the some of the people mentioned by Justice Fancourt today, compounded that apparent offence by then giving evidence, uh, uh, including at the Leveson inquiry, that appears to directly contradict what Justice Fancourt has found to be the case in the course of this um, this court case. It's 12.41, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Thank you, Harry. I hope all those who have attacked him for simply loving his wife now see that he has helped us all. Um, my view of Harry was always that he was victimised. You could see the tide turn against him after his wedding. Those who claim, well, if you're famous, you should just expect this kind of thing, should realise that they could go after you too. Um, my ex got caught up in a story some years ago. I'm reading this text and um, had journalists going through their bins looking for anything that they could. Uh, and I have always questioned why the media, this is Heather, have reported Harry and Meghan with such vitriol. The change for me today is a huge respect 
for Prince Harry's courage and the courage of his wife in pursuing this case. That courage is of great significance and hopefully will be a step towards more honesty in the press. I, mm, I wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't hold your breath on that second point. I, I don't think this will even... I wonder how it will get reported tomorrow. What's Mail Online doing with it? Has anyone looked at Mail Online yet? I, 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 wonder what, I wonder how this will get reported tomorrow. I don't know whether the ruling I haven't checked would have any um, instruction on how the Mirror itself should report it. You'd, you'd sometimes expect them to be told that they need to put details of the settlement in in a certain way, either on the front page or, 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 or published with a certain degree of prominence. But I haven't come across that yet in the judgment, although, as Evan Harris told us a moment ago, it does run to, it does run to hundreds of pages. Time now, just coming up to 12.43. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we are... Uh, responding to the news that Prince Harry's case against Mirror Group newspapers has been highly successful, let me, by way of a, of a slight departure, and, and I think this refers to newspapers as well, actually, but I'm not sure what clip they've used. Uh, Dominic Grieve is my guest on Full Disclosure this week, and uh, former Attorney General, of course, who was essentially thrown out of the Conservative Party by Boris Johnson in 2019. And I, I wanted to speak to him for a number of reasons, but not least because talking about Rishi Sunak and talking about uh, Boris Johnson and talking about sundry other members of the current Conservative Party, it occurred to me a couple of weeks ago when we invited Dominic on that we probably all need a reminder that there, there are decent Tories out there. Um, it's just very easy to forget that at the moment. So you now find yourself as a, 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 a traditional one nation conservative, as a, as, a, as, a, as a safeguarder of stability, as, as a man whose political career had been defined by attention to detail, by, um, by advice and principle. You, you find yourself as a, as a rebel. You find yourself in, in the position of being a, a rallying point for, for dissent. Um, you didn't see that one coming. No, I didn't. No, <laughs> if somebody had told me this was how I, my political parliamentary career was going to end, uh, I would have expressed astonishment. This rather establishment figure yes. <laughs> yes, en precisely. ending up uh, putting down motions in the House of Commons and changing standing orders and... Uh, you were desperately trying to reach the brakes, really, yes. weren't you? Yeah, I was. Doing anything yeah. in your power yeah. just to yeah. apply the brake. Well, I want to apply that. I also wanted to give people time to pause for thought. Yes. It's worth remembering that my first rebellion was over process. Yes. It was about the fact that in order to achieve Brexit, astonishingly for a Conservative government, Theresa May had decided that the whole of any subsequent deal could be pushed through under statutory instruments. Yeah. And I said, but this is completely constitutionally unacceptable. And that was the first rebellion. Mm. On, late, on a point of, I uh, mean, timeless principle. Timeless principle. So, and we got so, and then of course the hostility started coming in, and people started. Yeah. You get, you get trolled, and 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 you're getting uh, you, the the volume of um, abuse starts personal, to pile up. Personal abuse. Yes. Front pages of the Daily Mail. Quite frightening, I'd have thought. Oh, the Daily Mail were was exceptionally um, wicked, in my view. Yeah. I, I don't mind them criticising me, but but when they they sent a journalist over to... I've got a house in France, in mm. Brittany. It's my holiday home. Um, I don't know what they thought it was, whether they thought I was living in a chateau with a swimming pool, but it's certainly not that. <laughs> um, they sent a journalist over to take a photograph of it and to talk, speak to all my neighbours. What does he do when he comes here? Well, the answer is I go scuba diving and, and a bit of sailing and, and uh, swimming and running, and it's very nice. It's a simple holiday. Um, and... Uh, they then not only published the photograph, but they identified the location. So a week later, I was getting emails saying, I've found you on Google Earth and I'm going to come and kill you. And I, it, it, there were, to my mind, that, that shows uh, there was no necessity to identify the location well, with that precision. It's absolutely one mile outside the village. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.49 is the time, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, uh, where we have spent uh, most, most of the last hour responding to the um, uh, judgment in the High Court that found Mirror Group newspapers had indeed unlawfully uh, accessed information from the phone of Prince Harry and one of his other 
uh, uh, colleagues in bringing that case, the Coronation Street actor Michael Lavelle, as he is known popularly to you. I'm just waiting to make contact with a journalist who was at the Mirror Group during much of that period and who has previously pleaded guilty to phone hacking um, but has subsequently become something of a of a poacher turned gamekeeper. While we try and make contact with him, um, Henry Riley is here with a story that you have been pursuing for some time. Well, James, it was back on your programme in September that we reported Michael Gove's local authority, Surrey Heath, faced effective bankruptcy within two years because of what was described as horrific financial mismanagement. Just to run you through that again very quickly, they bought two sites, uh, the Square, which was a shopping centre for a a lot of money, uh, and the House of Fraser site, £113 million combined. Their value now is £33 million, which, as we said at the time, was a loss uh, of £79 million and a potential loss of 71% because I got my calculator out. Um, Today we can reveal further instances of financial mismanagement at the council. They lost £800,000 further from the property portfolio. That's because of high interest rates and falling rents. They also anticipate there will be an additional £300,000 of taxpayers' money needed for minimum revenue provision, essentially money set aside to pay back a loan. But James, in terms of the debt of the council, we reported on your show that it was around £170 million. We now learn it is raised by an extra £30 million. Extraordinary. So the debt at Surrey Heath is likely over £200 There was an exchange at the council earlier this month between Sean MacDonald, he's the Lib Dem leader of the council, it was previously Conservative for 49 years continuously, and Bob Watson, who's the Strategic Director for Finance. So that's 300,000 per year extra in MRP payments. Do I understand that correctly? That would be 300,000 going into the base budget, yes. And what's the change in the capital financing requirement associated with that, please? We believe the capital finance requirement may previously have been based on our borrowing rather than the actual capital financing requirement and therefore slightly understated which is why you've had to increase it for next year. Capital finance requirement currently is assessed as £207 million. So the difference between our borrowing and the capital finance requirement is what we funded from internal resources. Would I be right in thinking around £30 million would be the right answer? Yes. Now, Bob Watson does insist the council is not in immediate financial distress. We've re- obtained a recording, though, James, from April 2019 from a town hall event. It wasn't broadcast. It was um, recorded quietly. Uh, you'll hear from Paul Ilnicki in this recording. He's an ex-Surrey Heath um, Conservative councillor and a serving councillor, Edward Hawkins. They're speaking with a resident. How much have you borrowed? £5 million? Pounds, £10 million? Pounds? No, no, no. It's, it's, it's over, over £100 million. You borrowed over £100 million? Pounds? Yes. What's the budget of the council? 100 million sounds like a lot of money. Please be assured we're working very hard to achieve what I've just described. Oh, can I come in and just help you out and just add to this one? Um, Because property is my business, um, if I may. And um, we borrowed £85 million in the first place to buy what is now known as the square. And we have spent something in the order of £4 million in refurbishing. Now, at the time, Michael Gove was also in that meeting. The councillor who you heard from insisted there was no risk to local residents. I have to say that none of us in this room who are residents of Surrey Heath are at risk from the money we've borrowed. Now, previously, there's been no direct link to Michael Gove, James, of course, because he, whilst he's a local MP, he's not involved with the council, though he is, of course, the cabinet minister responsible for local government. At that meeting, in this recording we've obtained, he said he had every confidence in the investments going to plan. And then the other thing is, whatever the future of commercial centres will be, the demand for residential property is such that borrowing at uh, public, public works loan board rate in order to ensure that you can get residential property means that those developers in the future who are developing that residential property should pay a pretty penny for it. So provided everything goes according to plan, which I have every confidence that it will, it won't just be the current return on the money borrowed that we will see. We'll also see a windfall benefit when uh, uh, residential developers are building the flats and homes that will be part of this overall development. So Michael Gove said he had confidence in the plan, and as you'll hear here, James, um, it got a little testy with some of the local residents. You have a future-forward-looking council that says technology is going to change. But they're not, looking, people, they're not looking at all the no, technologies. No, 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 no. no. Wait, 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 wait,
Ooh. Michael Gove getting slightly testy with a... What, why would he get involved in this at all? Is that normal for an MP? Well, because he was a local MP, he was seeking to justify some of the purchases the council have made to local residents. Um, and of course, with that portfolio as being the local government secretary, um, he had an interest as well. He does, of course, distance himself from those plans. Just lastly, James, to give you the response from the department, they say local authorities have seen an increase in core spending power up to 5.1 billion or 9.4% in cash terms. They add that Surrey Heath of which has received 12.4 million, whilst a Tory source has told me this is yet more nonsense from the Surrey Heath Lib Dems in what appears to be an attempt to justify future council hacks tight council tax hikes uh, on local residents. They say the Lib Dems should stop playing politics and focus on delivering for the residents of Surrey Heath. What a curious business. I think there's going to be council tax hikes up and down the country shortly because uh, whether they're Le- Labour-led, Tory-led or Lib Dem-led, the the, the the Micawber effect is kicking in, isn't it? They've got a heck of a lot more money going out than they have coming in. Well, and c- there are councils like Spellthorn, which, of course, yes. conservative run, which have huge debts. And I think, as you say, James, any a matter of time before that um, does hit a sort of cliff edge. You've never hacked any phones, have you, Henry? No, no. I can barely use my <laughs> phone myself. <laughs> it's coming up to 12.57. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, qu- quick word, I think, from Michael in Otley. Um, Michael, what would you like to say? Yeah, it was just... Uh, it was just um yeah, I was quite surprised when I when I heard the sort of reading from the, uh, you know, about the uh, dismantling the sworn testimony of uh, Mirror Group on on your show, and you know, is Mr. Though, Morgan a worried man? Yeah, well, you'd have to imagine so. Like, I, I, the thing is, none of us have got any precedents for this, really, because uh, previously, anybody found in a in a similar situation or found to have conducted themselves in a similar way has faced has faced the full force of the law more than one journalist have, have, have ended up in jail so the i, I don't I, I mean the the short answer is i don't know but um uh, Piers morgan has always been so generous and compassionate in his treatment of other people in the public eye that i'm sure he can expect a huge reciprocation of care and concern from uh, from from people like prince harry and and his wife and indeed others it's it's coming up to 12:58 and um thank you michael we shall Hand over to Sheila shortly, but first um, let me remind you that Dominic Grieve is the guest on this week's Full Disclosure. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable conversation that I underto- I booked him or invited him on largely because he's been such a clear-eyed critic of what's happened to his party subsequently. But actually, once we got stuck into it, I found myself at least as, if not more, interested in, in his sort of career before this little period of him being a, 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 a kind of critic of where the Tories have been taken since they put the liar Boris Johnson in charge. And it, it just, it, I found it quite uplifting, I'll be honest with you, because it reminded me that some people, including conservatives, do go into politics out of a sense of public service or public duty. So if you, like me, sometimes despair at the state of uh, the Tory party, then I think it, you'll find it a particularly uplifting listen. Um, If you've missed any of today's show, then you can catch up on Global Player. Listen to the whole show podcast where you can also pause and rewind live radio. All of LBC's shows are there as well as the world's biggest podcasts. Pause and rewind live radio on Global Player where you're always in control. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick. But now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. I look forward very much to listening to that. He is... uh A bit of a political hero of mine. Mine too now, actually. A a proper gent as well. Yeah, absolutely. And effective Mm. and uh, principled. All those things we really need and currently don't really have. James O'Brien on LBC. 